we'll start off with uh, introductions. Um, so um, I know that some of you are Paddle Monster people, and um, uh, you don't need any introductions, but some of you are not. We promoted this in a lot of different places where we don't usually promote. And um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with us, we'll do some introductions. My name is Larry Kane, and um, I used to paddle a uh, sprint canoe. Um, I grew up paddling sprint canoe. And then um, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, 2010, so 12 years ago, I got involved in stand-up paddling. Found it's very much like my sprint canoe and um, uh, have never looked back. It's uh, been great. It's really rejuvenated my paddling career and um, my ability to go out and enjoy being in the water because quite frankly, uh, the sprint canoe isn't so friendly to an aging body. Um, and then um, joining me today is uh, Victoria Burgess, who is a, one of our Paddle Monster coaches. Uh, Victoria is not only a super accomplished uh, sup racer and surfer, but she's also a certified sport nutritionist and a PhD in exercise science. So she's a really valuable part of our team. And um, if you're looking for someone who can talk to you about fitness and fitness training and fitness testing and diet and all that kind of stuff, uh, she is the expert in that area, as well as all the paddle coaching and surf coaching. She just mm -hmm. ran a really successful uh, camp in March uh, in her hometown hood of uh, Fort, uh, Fort Pierce, uh, Florida, and um, uh, like a surf camp sub surf camp and it was it was it was excellent and then also we've got lisa shell uh from paddle monster and, and um lisa i met lisa at chatterjack uh probably seven or eight years ago and um lisa doesn't come from a from a paddling background she comes from an active background but she started paddling as an adult and um uh, has done sup paddling sub surfing outrigger paddling surf ski paddling so she's really embraced uh, water sports and the whole water culture. She's moved from North Carolina to Hawaii. She lives on Maui now, so she can do this kind of stuff year round in the best conditions in the world. And um, so uh, she's got a really unique perspective too, especially when we're, when we're talking about um, things like we're talking about tonight, where we're not necessarily focused on racing and high level, uh, you know, performance and that type of thing. We're talking about uh, people going out and enjoying stand-up paddling, uh, people of all levels going out and enjoying stand-up paddling for a workout. So, um, so the way it's going to work is uh, Victoria is going to lead us off um, with a discussion on the benefits of stand-up paddling for fitness. And uh, she's going to give us some tips on how to structure a workout, give us some examples of different types of workouts that accomplish different fitness goals, because there's more to fitness than just fitness, right? There's, there's different types of um, uh, like uh, energy systems that we use to drive our activity. And she's gonna tell us how we can train each of those energy systems on our stand-up power board. Um, and, then, um, and then I'm gonna take over and I'm gonna talk about technique, which is really important um, you know, beyond uh, you know, uh, for racing. Um, because clearly it's important there, but just to have a more enjoyable, a safer, more successful uh, experience if you're, you're doing sup recreationally for fitness. So we'll go into it, we'll dive into a conversation about technique. We'll look at some videos, I'll show you some land drills that you can do at home, that type of thing. So um, uh, I'd like to get started. Um, Lisa's going to kind of, she'll chime in here and there when she's got a, a nugget of information that she thinks we've forgotten about or that's really important. But um, she's also going to be monitoring the chat side of this. So if you have a question that you would like to ask, just uh, post it in the chat and then she'll be monitoring it. And when she sees a question that um, she thinks is timely to what we're talking about, um, she'll interrupt and, uh, you know, and uh, let us know what the question is so we can, whoever's presenting at that time can address it. And then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A as well, okay? So it's 704, we've got 41 participants, which is tremendous. This will be available for you to view afterwards as well on our website. So let's get started. Um, and um, I thank you all for joining us um, from wherever you are joining us. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Victoria. 
Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. And thanks to everybody for showing up. Um, I'm going to pop on a little screen share here so I can, I, I have a little PowerPoint just so we can see for all those visual learners. Um, there are some numbers involved with the fitness aspect that I want to chat about today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here for a second. I think that you should probably hopefully be able to see me as well, but yeah, yeah we can see you. Oh, yeah, you can. Okay. Awesome. Cool. I have to just, okay, there we go. I have to shrink it a little bit. Okay, so today, like Larry said, we're gonna be talking about sub training for fitness in many different aspects. Um, I know oops, several of you have gotten into this. Um, is this is this blocking? Okay, there we go. Several, several people have gotten into this for the benefits of the fitness in general. Um, some people got on the water to start off with because it was like a fun floaty thing and we're like, this is really cool. And now we wanna learn a little bit more about how can we improve our fitness using this tool? Um, and the greatest thing is you can in multiple, multiple ways. So unlike having to just think about improving your fitness by going out for a run, um, there are many ways we can improve that same fitness and more with stand-up paddling and other types of paddling as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the systems that we use, um, whether it be our cardiovascular system or our muscular system and how we can kind of train those just to get a little bit more out of um, paddling. If whether you want to race or just use it as a tool to better your body composition, better your cardiovascular fitness, um, there's all sorts of ways you can use paddling for those aspects. So paddling is a power endurance sport. So we know it's an endurance sport because most of us, we go out there and we're like, okay, I'm paddling around and this is hard because it's long and I'm breathing heavy. Um, but it, we also use a lot of power and we use a lot of muscular power as well. So that's, I think, personally, one of the greatest things about stand-up paddling is you're getting a true overall body inside and out workout. You're training your muscles, you're training your cardiovascular system, you're changing your body composition, you're doing squats, you're doing sprints, you're doing all sorts of stuff just by standing on a paddleboard. So that's awesome. It's like you're all in one stop shop. Um, so some of the specific fitness benefits are aerobic fitness, which most people refer to it as your cardio. I'm going to go for a cardio workout, um, your anaerobic fitness, which most people think of it as I'm going to go do some sprints, um, your muscular fitness, which we think about lifting weights, but we know that when, and Larry's going to talk, talk about this a lot more, um, when you're applying the right amount of pressure in the right spots for your technique, you're going to work your muscles in ways that you can still get the benefits just as if you were lifting at the gym. Um, there are also neurological benefits and it increases your balance, which is great for most of us um, just in general. So one thing I wanna talk about first as before we start, um, because heart rate max, and unfortunately when you start using any type of fitness, um, more than just going out for a run or more than just going out for a jog or a paddle, you have to start thinking a little bit. So when you start thinking a little bit, you're like, well, what am I supposed to think about? Because all I know is I'm going to go on my paddleboard and start paddling. Like, how do I even start this whole thing? Right? So most of us, we wear some sort of fitness watch, whether it be a Fitbit, a Garmin, an Apple watch. Um, some people just use it, um, a heart rate monitor attached to their phone. Um, but we all sort of, most of us have some sort of device that has that. If you don't, that's fine too. I'm going to explain what you can do if you don't. What's that? Okay. I was um, just going to say, like, for years, when I, when I was paddling canoe before, we the heart rate monitors were even, you know, a thing. <laughs> yeah, you exactly. You do it this way, right? <laughs> we yeah, count like, in seconds, right? So whenever we take in an interval, we, we we just take our heart rate and multiply for 10 seconds, multiply by by six. And, so you uh, really had a thing back then. Now we're oh, yeah, Stone Age, right? But uh, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, well, so, so yeah, we are spoiled and you could do it with by checking your pulse and using your regular watch. Um, I will talk about a rate of perceived exertion scale as well, but luckily we have technology these days. However, the one thing I do want to point out in the beginning is these are not, oh, blurry, um, are not 100% reliable or 100% accurate. There are some that are more so than others. So I recommend um, doing some research in the ones you're buying. You can message me at all. I've done some research on some of the ones that are ac more accurate, more reliable. Um, the most accurate way to get your heart rate from those watches is through a chest strap. If you're paddling and you're looking at your watch with no chest strap, it might be a little more accurate when you're running because it, your arm doesn't move as much, but 
before I had a chest strap when I was paddling, it was way off. So I highly recommend for the sport of paddling to get yourself a chest strap. I know it's not like the most fun thing. I've gone for a paddle and forgot to take it off for like an hour. And I'm like, man, I wonder why like my ribs feel so tight. And then I took it off and I'm like, oh, I can breathe. Um, but yeah, get yourself a chest strap. It's definitely a great tool to have. Um, it's going to be the way we set up your workouts, the way you maybe set up your workouts um, and just something to go off of. So just in as example, the way people have measured heart rate max for many, many years, um, some people have higher and lower, but this is just the general is 220 minus your age. So for an example, a 40 year old person, you would say 220 minus 40 is 180 beats per minute would be your max heart rate. Um, and then the percentages are typically what programs are written off of. So the percentages of your max heart rate, um, the aerobic area, which we'll go more in depth is around 60 to 70%. So you can see for a 40 year old, that would be at 108 beats per minute to 126 beats per minute. Um, and then as you increase your intensity, the heart, your heart rate's obviously going to go up. Um, so that's kind of where you can see the different zones of am I, am I anaerobic or aerobic zone? Am I in an anaerobic zone? And you do really want to pay attention, which I'm going to talk about in detail um, because there are different benefits to staying in one zone or another. So write this little calculation down here and figure it out for your ages. You don't have to tell anybody. We're not going to try to figure out your age. You're good. Um, but it's definitely useful to have. If you don't have or don't use a uh, heart rate monitor, there is a rate, rate of perceived exertion scale or RPE scale. Sometimes you'll see this written as well on um, training plans, or you can write it for yourself. It goes from a scale of one to 10. Uh, most of the work is done around a four to nine. So most training programs are four to nine. You can see here your aerobic work is probably going to be so that 60 to 70% of your heart rate max is probably going to be more in this four to six area. Um, once it starts creeping into the seven, definitely eight and nine, it starts switching over into anaerobic. So the rate of perceived exertion scale is great. As you can read here on the screen, it shows, you know, I can hold a conversation and then all of a sudden now I can't, I can only speak a sentence and now I can barely breathe. So it kind of gives you that what's going on, how do I feel and where, where do I perceive this? The only problem with the rate of perceived exertion scale is if you've had an exhausting day or you're mentally tired or you know, you're, just, you're just tired, you might be like, oh my God, this is so hard. I'm definitely working at a seven to eight. Oh. And your heart, you look at your heart rate, you're like at hundred beats a minute. So it's always good to have, I think the both, just so that way you can actually see some of the psychological things that happen when you are tired from a long day at work. Um, and just know that, you know what, mm, maybe I'm not that tired. My heart's only hundred beats a minute. That's like maybe a one to two. So I'm going to have to bump it up some. So on those tired days, you get a little bit more um, boost to bring your performance up. So those are the two scales that we are going to be kind of chatting about as we talk about these different systems that we use for fitness. We're going to dive into the aerobic fitness. So this is what's what we call, I'm going to go out for a cardio workout, right? I'm going to go work out cardio. Um, aerobic fitness means aerobic means with oxygen. So your body's actually using oxygen to perform these tasks. Um, it works on your aerobic capacity. And like I mentioned before, these are going to be low to moderate paddles, 50, 60 to 75, 80% of your heart rate max. If you've done your math, you can kind of map it out now or the RPE of four to six, like I meant. The base of our training or the foundation of our training is done in this aerobic area. So 80% of our training should be done in our aerobic fitness. Um, Sometimes you'll go out there and you'll be working in your aerobic fitness area and you're like, am I actually doing something? But yes, you actually are. Um, it's really important to develop this aerobic base. It builds your speed for later. So the, the greater fitness you have aerobically, the faster you're going to get when you start working anaerobically. Uh, it develops a thing called the VO2 max, which some of you may know, some of you may not know what it is. I'm going to talk about it briefly in the next slide. Um, you're also going to start developing different fibers that you're using during your aerobic fitness. In this case, it's a type one muscle fiber. So the more you work on your aerobic fitness, the more you're going to recruit more of those fibers and you're going to be more efficient in your aerobic fitness. Um, another cool thing too, is while you're working out this aerobic system, so you're not just getting that cardiovascular, your heart not, is not just like 
doing awesome because now it's more efficient in pumping blood and you're getting it nice and strong, but you're also developing more blood vessels, which I think is really cool. And there's a lot of different studies on this where even short-term training, you can increase your blood vessels up to 30% in density, which in short-term, I mean like six to eight weeks, which I think is pretty cool that you're out there doing this aerobic work and your like body is changing in all sorts of ways that you wouldn't even think about normally, right? So the more blood vessels you have, the more oxygen supply you're going to have that's going to bring the oxygen to your muscles. And the more oxygen you have in your muscles, the more better you're going to perform. Hey, Victoria. Um, yep. Just want to jump in for a sec because we've got a really, really good question. And that sure. is, what does max heart rate actually mean? And the, the question comes from, um, let me get my thing here set up from uh, Bill, Bill Dawes, uh, who maybe is in New Zealand. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> anyway, he wants to know, does that, is that the maximum you should go or the rate your body can actually achieve? And that, yeah, um, that is right. Oops, go ahead. Uh, so anyway, if you just, and Larry is addressing that also in the chat, but if you wanna just take a quick moment to, um, to maybe answer that question for Bill. Okay. Yeah. And I just, I just pulled it up. So I see Larry's um, mm -hmm. response as well. So yeah, max heart rate is, it's not the max your heart can actually pump and that's it because some people are going to have a higher max heart rate than others. Some people are going to have a lower, some people are going to be like off the charts high. So like Larry said, it's a theoretical max that we use. So that way we can program um, unless you've gone through extensive testing for your own self. These are kind of ways that they've done research on to show kind of what works with the whole as a bigger, larger population. So um, you will sometimes train above your max if you have a higher heart rate, <laughs> um, but you would know yourself. And so it's important to make note of that, that, hey, when I go out and I just start paddling, you know, at RPE of, of four, my heart rate's already at 150. You know, so when you start seeing that kind of stuff, it's important to make notes of it. So that way you can kind of see where, where is your baseline, you know, unless you start getting into a lab and doing um, actual fitness testings like VO2 max and all of lactate threshold testing and stuff, um, your, how you know yourself is going to be just really important. So this is kind of like a generalized um, calculation that's just been used for years to develop training programs off of basically. Did that answer your question? And, and, and I just also say too, this, this I think to me underscores why you should use the two methods. Um, <laughs> you know, your, your, your max heart or your percentage of uh, max heart rate, um, but also um, your uh, rate of perceived exertion, because um, you know, if you, if you constantly are, look, are checking your heart rate, but also in tune with your rate of perceived exertion, you can pretty quickly figure out, um, you know, how the two merge and where your ideal training uh, level should be, you know, for each type mm -hmm. of training. Um, but um, um, yeah, it, it's a it's a theoretical max. You know, it's a calculation that is used to quickly sort of pigeonhole everyone in society uh, what their max heart rate should be. And clearly, um, you know, it's applied to sedentary people as well as athletic people like ourselves. So we're going to be oftentimes we bust the calculation a little bit like we have the capability to have a higher max heart rate um, but it does it, it, it still allows us to train pretty effectively using this as an estimation yeah and then there's some people who may have some cardiovascular um, <clears throat> diseases or maybe you have a higher heart rate just in general um, maybe your resting heart rate's higher so that also affects it um, so just knowing you is really important um, and the sport of paddling too, it makes it really interesting because you'll see as we go along, um, you can be aerobically fit, but you might have to work on your muscular endurance and it'll be hard sometimes to even get your heart rate up to that max. And I'll talk about that when I start talking about the anaerobic work, but um, it, yeah, it's just a, it's just a number that we, that's been used for years to, like I said, pitch everybody into some sort of calculation. So hopefully that answered that. Um, so then, yeah, for aerobic fitness, like I said, with oxygen, um, but it also starts to develop your lactate threshold, which is going to start dipping into anaerobic work. So what is an example of an aerobic workout? We're going to give you examples of all sorts of workouts here today. So that way you kind of can get an idea when you go out on the water. 
Um, remember, 80% of your work should be done in aerobic workouts. Um, and this is just one example. There can be, there's a whole plethora of them, but we always want to make sure when we're doing workouts that we warm up and cool down properly, right? We don't want to just go out there and, and go crazy and then come off. We want to get our muscles warm. We don't pull anything. We don't strain anything. Um, so five minute warm up could be on the land. You could do a little jog, maybe some jumping jacks, maybe some just dynamic movements um, or on the water. You can go paddle at a slow pace, maybe a level one, level two pace. And then you want to get into a 45 minute steady state cardio pace at 60% of your heart rate max. So whatever that might be, or RPE scale of five. Um, and that could be ranging from four to six. So you might see four to six, but in this workout, it's five. Um, so you're basically going to try to hold that 60% heart rate max or your rate of perceived desertion at a five for the entire 45 minutes. This can be hard because you get on a, a song that you like and you're like, woohoo and you start like pumping it up some and next thing you know you're like now going fast your heart rate starting to beat we really want to pay attention during these aerobic workouts that we don't start working too much anaerobically right um the, the two systems are going to intertwine sometimes or another but we want to spend the majority of this time at that 60 70 percent of heart rate max so pay attention during these longer 45 minute 30 45 minute sessions that you are keeping that heart rate max um, at whatever is prescribed and then a 10 minute cool down, light paddle, just cool down, slow your heart rate down, give it a chance to cool off, um, get yourself off your board. You can stretch if you want, that's cool too. But yeah, make sure you warm up, cool down, really important, um, especially in anaerobic work. But so this is one example of an aerobic workout. Larry, do you have any, any fun examples of an aerobic workout you wanna add? Yeah, um, sure, you, you can do, I mean, the easiest way to do an aerobic workout is to just go steady for you know a period of time. So uh, Victoria's used forty five minutes. That's a sort of a good distance. I you know on programs I'll put as low as thirty minutes and as high as 70, 75, 80 minutes. Um, but you know forty five is a good kind of mid range type of of um, aerobic workout. But you can also do intervals. Okay, and intervals is just basically breaking up the the 45 minutes or the 50 minutes or whatever it is that you're doing into smaller chunks uh punctuated by brief periods of rest and the, the key really when you're doing intervals uh, for uh, aerobic work is that the work uh, the ratio of work to rest be very large right so like you know we're talking 10 to 1 or 15 to 1 or you know that in that range uh, 8 to 1 maybe um where you're you know, so an example would be doing 10 minute repeat pieces with only one minute of rest. And so your heart rate never really has time to, to, to drop too much in the one minute of rest. Um, and the reason you might do this is because, um, you know, we'll talk about technique later, but when you're paddling, um, you know, you, your muscles will become fatigued and, and especially for people that are, um, and your nervous system that controls the muscles will become fatigued as well. And for, Paddlers that are training to race, it's really important that they they take as many good strokes as possible, technically efficient strokes as possible, and minimize the number of bad strokes they take. And so, just taking that that one minute break every say ten minutes gives them a little bit of a chance to sort of stand up straight in their board, kind of maybe stretch for a second, refocus mentally on how they want to be paddling, and then they start the next piece. And usually, their technical you know, uh, uh, paddling is better than it was at the end of the, the piece before, um, because mm -hmm. they've had a chance to kind of refocus and gather themselves and, and, you know, uh, they tend to be able to, to paddle better again until they start to get fatigued. Um, sure. and so it's just a trick that we can use in training as, as a coach to, uh, to make sure that the, the majority of the paddling is done at a high quality rather than, you know, if you start to get tired and the paddling quality goes down and you're just grinding it out trying to keep your heart rate in the training zone so um and, and it also makes it more interesting it's more fun and it helps the time pass more quickly too if you're you know either looking at your watch and doing the math to calculate the intervals or you've set your 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 sport watch and it's beeping and telling you when to go to to go harder when to go easier um and um yeah so so you can interval train too but the key is that the unlike intervals for speed and for you know for uh, anaerobic and threshold training that Victoria will talk about momentarily? The, the key here is that the, the work 
be very large and the rest be very small. For sure, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, even using some of this training as technique, you know, technique training, you can still do, you know, paying more attention to your technique because like we said, we are trying to keep it where you're not pushing yourself to want to sprint because I know we're all, you know, distracted, like, whoo, look at the bird, um, twirl. But yeah, so just keeping it there, focusing on, on other things um, and making sure that technique is good is important. So 80% of your work should be done in this area, this aerobic workout area. I keep pushing over. And, okay, VO2 max, I'm just gonna talk about this for one quick second, um, just because I know there's been some questions about it. I know many of you have heard about it. What is it anyways? Um, basically VO2 max is a measure of your aerobic capacity. So what we just chatted about, it's a test that you go into lab and you take it and they measure your aerobic capacity, your, your respiratory exchange rate, how much your body, how much oxygen your body is able to use at your max exercise. Um, you have to wear, I'm sure you've seen pictures of people, they wear like these masks things when they're running on a treadmill. Um, we've actually been trying to do a little bit of testing with portable ones that they're coming out with now. So we maybe will be able to use it in paddling in the future, which would be great. Um, your VO2 max is based on the demands of your muscles. So the more in shape that your aerobic system is, the more efficient you're gonna be overall, right? So your heart's gonna work more efficiently. If your heart's pumping blood out more efficiently, your body's gonna get more oxygen, your muscles are gonna get more oxygen, you're gonna improve your workout output. Um, and in turn, you're gonna have greater performance and speed. So like I said, it must be tested in a lab, but what I wanted to bring up here is that heart rate is correlated with oxygen uptake so that's why we use heart rate training because most of us are, we don't go run into a lab to get our VO2 max tested. So heart rate is a good measure of where we're at when it comes to aerobic capacity because it is correlated with oxygen uptake. So just so you know, um, they are correlated. All right, we're gonna move into anaerobic fitness. So we just talked about aerobic fitness, which was your body using oxygen as fuel. Now we're gonna be going into anaerobic work, which is your body using no oxygen. So it's without oxygen. Um, these are very short duration uh, exercises, a few seconds, literally 10 seconds, maybe sometimes 30 seconds. Remember these are interchangeable. So sometimes you'll start with anaerobic work. And if it's a little bit longer, your body is gonna switch over into the aerobic area. Um, these works typically go into 80 to 85% of your heart rate max. So you're seeing now that we're starting to creep up a little bit on our heart rate. So now we know it's going to be getting a little harder, maybe on that rate of perceived desertion scale, it's now getting into the seven area, maybe the eight area. Um, the anaerobic fitness, these are kind of, uh, people think of it as doing sprints, for an example, that would be an example of anaerobic work. Um, whereas before I said aerobic is doing cardio, um, so people say, I'm going to go do sprints. You're okay, you're working your anaerobic system. Um, it does increase power. These little short burst, burst of movement increases your power. So like times where you need a sprint to start or maybe sprint at the end, um, all this work kind of helps you increase your anaerobic fitness, your lactic threshold and get through that part with as much power as possible. This is why um, paddling is a power endurance sport. While you're not lifting weights, uh, Olympic lifts, you're still doing that kind of work with anaerobic fitness in how you're paddling. Um, and Larry can talk more about that um, when he talks about technique and how much stress you're going to be putting on your muscles um, with your technique for this specific activity. Um, it does take a little longer to develop your anaerobic system due to increased recovery time. So 80% is aerobic work, right? That leaves us with 20% of anaerobic or lactate threshold work. Because of the muscle fibers that are being brought into this work, um, it does take longer or it's re recommended to take longer uh, recovery periods between these sessions that you do. Um, so because you're not always working it, it does take a little longer to develop. Um, and you are gonna be working type two fibers. So you're gonna be working different muscle fibers unlike your, um, a, your aerobic system. So you're gonna be bringing other muscle fibers and you can actually develop muscle fibers as you work those specific systems. So if you, know, you wanna be better at sprinting, you can do more sprint work and your muscle fibers will actually develop in that area. So it's pretty neat. Um, aerobic fitness also increases muscle math, mass and strength, whereas an, um, anaerobic, I'm sorry, whereas aerobic fitness sometimes is known to burn fat mass, right? So this is kind of where you're increasing that muscle mass, that muscle strength. Can, can I just add, Victoria, like I know when, um, 
when um, when I used to teach my kinesiology class when I was a teacher, uh, the kids were always confused about you know the without oxygen part, and they always thought like, well, like are you holding your breath or you know are you doing it underwater or something like that, and so I always explained it like like if you're working anaerobically, the reason you don't you, it's without oxygen is, is because your aerobic system can't keep up with right. yep. the muscles demand for oxygen. Like it's trying to supply the muscles with the oxygen they want, but it can't meet the demand because the muscles are working so hard, trying to produce fuel for muscle contraction so hard, yeah. you know, at such a high level. So the anaerobic system actually kicks in and it makes up for that shortfall and it, and it doesn't use oxygen to do it. And so right. that's, where, that's where it fits in. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a great system that it does kick in like that because it allows us to go harder than we otherwise could um, with the aerobic system alone. But the, the problem is it produces lactate, lactic acid, which is, I know uh, Victoria is going to talk about. And that becomes a limiting factor to, you know, to performance. Like eventually lactate builds up so high that you can't continue to go. So, um, yeah. you know, so exactly. I just want to add that because I know that the, the students always used to struggle with the like the without oxygen part yeah so with the anaerobic workouts and and in this uh in this slide right here actually for short-term energy supplies so and, and your anaerobic system is gonna use either um uh creatine phosphate or glycogen to supply we have them stored in our body you know or we we eat them through um nutrition as well so that's why some people take creatine um also fuel that you're having carbohydrates glucose glycogen um, those are the stores that your muscles are going to use and the turnover rate is fast for those. So that's why you're able to use them at that fast rate um, just for little bits of time before then you wind up slowing down because you have to, your body will force you um, and your muscles will start then using the oxygen again. So yeah, they are, um, what's really important for anaerobic workouts too, is that you include that period of recovery. Um, this is very difficult for people because, um, nobody wants to just sit there and wait. <laughs> um, it happens on the water. It happens in the gym. You, you'll look at your training program and you're like, like for this example down here, I have of a sprint workout for sprint workouts or anaerobic workouts. Um, you really want to get a good warm up First of all, you don't want to just go out there and just start sprinting, you know, as hard as you can. Um, that's not a good idea. So in this example workout, I have a 10 minute warm up. Um, during these warmups, it can be on the land. I recommend that you spend a lot of it also in the water. And when you're warming up, slowly start to increase your pace as you go along with these warmups. So that way you can kind of get ready for those hard work, you know, that you're about to do at these 85, 95% um, work. So you're going to build up and then you, in this workout, you do three times 12 seconds at 85% or RPE of eight. So you're going to do three, three 12 second sprints. So that one sprint's only going to last 12 seconds, but it's going to be like the longest, well, not the longest, the second longest, because the next batch is going to be the longest, but second longest 12 seconds of your life um, for that moment anyway. And then there's going to be 60 seconds of rest in between. And you're like, wait a minute. So you're telling me I'm going to sprint for like 12 seconds or 20 seconds. I got to sit there and wait for a minute. Yep. That's what I'm telling you. And the reason why is because not only does your body accumulate this lactate, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide, but you're stressing your nervous system. Um, you've now depleted your energy supplies that I just spoke about, not the oxygen, the creatine phosphate, the glycogen. So your muscles only have a bit of those, right? When you stop for that 60 seconds or whatever the rest period be, believe it or not, there's a lot of work that you do in weightlifting three reps and you rest for two to four minutes, mm -hmm. you know? So here we're only talking a minute, but you're gonna just sit there and look for starfish or shark fins or whatever you're gonna look for. Um, during those 60 seconds, think about it now. And I like to visualize like my muscles now are starting to like regenerate. Like I'm getting like, ooh, all my, everything, the supplies of glycogen are coming back. My creatine phosphate, it's getting ready. Like my nervous system's like getting ready, getting ready, cooling down, cooling down. And then you're gonna go again. So that's the reason why these rest periods are just as important as your work periods in these anaerobic um, workouts. I personally think, I mean, they're definitely just as important because if you're not getting that full recovery, you're not getting the most out of that 12 seconds that you can. We want to stress the nervous system. We want that lactate to build up. But if you're not 
coming in with a fresh slate, then you're just, you're not, you're not using the hundred percent of what you can build up. Basically you're coming off a little bit more tired. So when your coach prescribes you these rest periods as boring as they are, um, do them because they're really important. So for this workout, three times 12 seconds, 60 seconds in between each one, and then a five times 12 second sprints at 95% or RPE of nine with a 90 second rest and then a cool down for 10 minutes. So that would be one of my sprint workouts um, that I would prescribe. And I just put the RPE scale up here so you can see that eight to nine or that nine level is I can barely breathe and only speak a few words. So for those five times 12 seconds, you want to barely breathe for 12 seconds. And I don't mean hold, don't hold your breath on purpose, but you're going to be really huffing and puffing, right? That eight is borderline uncomfortable. Shorter breath can speak a sentence. So those are the uh, RPE scales. So um, Victoria, when we talk about rest, again, another, another comment from the chat, um, is that active rest where we're still moving or still paddling maybe very lightly, or are we stopping and putting the, taking the paddle out of the water, or, you know, if, if you're in a outrigger or surf ski, are you putting the paddle in your lap to rest and stop? Or yeah, so for this one, um, and you can do both, there's both. Um, for this one in specific, it's literal just rest, rest, no moving. I mean, you might move forward, but no, no paddling, just rest, rejuvenate your whole entire system. Um, there are gonna be active rests, and I'm gonna talk about that in the lactate threshold um, training, but there are gonna be times where you actually can just keep paddling in between. Um, but some of these sprint workouts, you wanna just rest, you know. It, can, can I just add one thing too? I'm looking yeah. at another question on there. It said, it says 12 seconds feels awfully short to get up to 85%. How do you calibrate your effort to get up there? And, and so that's a very good question. Like if, mm -hmm. if this is where you, again, you, you have to use perceived exertion yeah. because in a, in such a short interval, like 15 seconds or less, or even 30 seconds, you know, like in that range, um, it's awfully hard to get your heart rate up to 85% of max in that short period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you kind of have to do is you kind of have to, to go uh, by perceived exertion and kind of go like what you feel like is 85% of your maximum effort. Yeah. And, um, and if you do that, um, you know, over the course of the workout, um, because 60 seconds seems like a lot of rest, but, you know, by the standard of the, 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 the rest that uh, athletes training to sprint, get in their workouts. Uh, that's a very short amount of rest. Um, over the course of the, you know, the workout, your heart rate's gonna. It'll be easier for it to climb, you know, uh, closer to eighty-five percent range in that short interval. Um, but um, you know, like initially, if you're looking for your heart rate to get up to eighty-five percent in twelve seconds, it's not going to happen. So yeah. um, it's not you're not going hard enough. It's just that your heart just simply doesn't have time to, to catch up to the effort that you're doing. So you have to go by perceived exertion. And I guess the other thing I would say just with regards to the rest is that, um, you know, I mentioned athletes who are sprinters take, you know, when they're doing their sprint work, they take even more rest. So uh, like as an example, like, you know, the, the, the kayak team, the Canadian kayak team, when I was working with the national team uh, pre Rio, they were doing uh, their, the men's 200 meter team, uh, which is an event that in a K1 takes about 35 seconds. Um, they were doing 30 second repeats and they were taking eight minutes of rest between each 30 second repeat. And they would actually get out and sit on the dock and um, out of their kayaks and sit on the dock and wait for the next piece. And, um, and that's fine because that's rest, but I also encourage them to not sit on the dock until it was 30 seconds to the next piece. So I encouraged them to sit in the dock for, you know, if it was eight minute rest for maybe four minutes and then get in their boat and paddle around slowly because you're going to flush lactate from your muscles a little bit better if you're moving rather than sitting still. Yeah, so yeah, the eight minutes. Wow, that's, yeah, that's long. See? Yeah, I mean, that's- I'm that's, only asking for one minute here, guys. Extreme, like, right? Like this is <laughs> athletes who are training to sprint. This is what- right. You know, men's you know? sprinter is on the track are going to do too, right? There, exactly, yeah. Seconds is way incomplete rest for them, but yeah, it's simply because the they're going like all out when they're sprinting, and the demands 
on their nervous system, which is what recruits the maximal number of muscle fibers possible to the task of running down the track, uh, it requires time to recover yep. between each piece so that they can, in the next piece, they can again give a maximal effort. Yeah. And so they, they err on the side of more rest rather than less. For sure. Yeah, and that's the goal of these workouts is that maximal effort. You want to be going as hard as you can that your body can use for these workouts. Um, so we want to be able to be refreshed every time in between each one as much as possible. And like Larry, you know, like this and many more, the rest periods are going to change depending on what the coach um, is doing for you for those workouts. But it really is important regardless of what it is to take those rest periods, like sit on your board, whatever it might be, turn on your music, do like a little dance, whatever. I don't know. Um, sing to yourself, look at the clouds, but take the rest. Okay, the fun, the fun part is lactate threshold. This thing is getting in the way. Um, oops. Okay, so for lactate threshold, a lot of people have heard of this. Um, many have not, I'm sure, but it's a byproduct of your anaerobic system. So it's basically that aerobic, I'm gonna turn anaerobic area, right? And so what we wanna do is to get faster, and it's shown a lot in research that this area of lactate threshold is what wins a lot of races. Um, so what happens is when Larry kind of talked about it is when lactate builds up faster than it can be cleared, um, it makes your muscles more acidic. And sometimes you'll feel like, you know, those times where you're like, oh my God, I was gonna puke, or maybe you did puke, um, or you feel your muscles are, you know, burning and you're just like, oh my gosh, you can't hold it anymore. Uh, I have to stop. That's when that lactate is building up. And now your body is going to have to switch over to use oxygen because it has too much lactate. It can't, it can't clear it out fast enough. Um, so the goal really is to build that threshold. Um, and the way you build that threshold is not to go above that threshold. Actually, it's just to stay just slightly, very, very slightly below it. Um, so the benefits of increasing that lactate threshold, it improves your speed in longer races and at the end of your race. So if you can hold that, I'm like almost feeling like I'm going to puke area and truly, truly hold it for longer than your person who's paddling next to you, you're going to outlast them. Right. So, and then at the end of the race, that's a really good example of when, when this kicks in as well, because you might be going, 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 and then you're like, Oh my gosh, there's a the finish line. I'm going to go. And then you go as hard as you can. And that lactate builds up and you're like, I have to sprint for hundred meters. Like, can I hold hundred meters? And you want to hold it as like long as you can, as hard as you can. Cause somebody else is coming, 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 coming. If you can't hold it, you're going to slow down. That other person might be able to, and you're like, oh, oh, here they come, here they come, here they come. Or maybe not. Maybe they're like, oh my gosh, can't catch them. Right. So this is that threshold area. That's really important to build up um, in, in every sport, especially endurance sports um, and especially paddling. It's great. It's a great area to work in, in uh, for paddling, but it does take a lot of work. Um, and it's not the most fun, fun area to do workouts because of the intensity of them. So the more efficient your aerobic system is, the longer and harder you can push before this accumulation will happen. Um, and then you don't have to slow down. So that's the goal, right? We don't want to slow down. We want to go as hard as we can for as long as we can and not slow down, keep battling. Um, so some examples of lactate threshold workouts, I say they're comfortably hard, but hardly comfortable. Uh, a couple of them that are, I'm, sh I'm sure working with us at Paddle Monster, you've probably seen some fartlek or tempo paddles. So an example of a tempo paddle. So these, and I guess on the RPE scale, it's kind of like one of these games where you're going to be pushing really hard, but at the same time, you want to keep that just below that level. You don't want to go above that threshold level. So the tempo paddles, it's kind of like a pace that you can sustain for an hour comfortably, but not comfortably. Okay, so it's gonna be right at that level. Um, in this workout, for an example, it's five minute warm up, 30 minutes at your 10K race pace. So once again, going back to the beginning of this whole thing, we now have to think, like we have to do some math, we have to do some 5K, 10K trials to see where we're at, or maybe you use your race, you know, your race uh, times that you've raced in. Take that number and that's where you wanna be. So 30, 30 minutes at that race pace. It can be kind of hard. And sometimes with these lactate threshold workouts, um, I've found it better to do actually um, on your own. 
because sometimes when you're with a group of people, you start racing. <laughs> uh, and so then you kind of lose concentration and it does take some concentration in this area to make sure you're, you're comfortably not comfortable. Um, so yeah, 30 minutes at your 10K race pace, race pace, meaning it's hard, um, or RP of six to seven or 80 to 85% of heart rate max. So you can see now we're creeping into the 80 percentages. That's not, you know, that's not too easy to want to stay at when you're paddling for 30 minutes, right? Unless you're in a race, because then you're just going and you're not even, I mean, you're not thinking, you're just going, right? But when you're out there on your own, you're like, okay, 30 minutes, 80%, you're getting tired. You got to keep that. We want to keep you at that threshold the whole time, right? Because the longer we can stay there, the more you're going to build it. And then a five minute cool down. So that would be a tempo paddle. Um, a lactate threshold of fart leg, fart leg training. I always think it's such a funny word. Where did they come from, Larry? I know you know. It's a Swedish, it means a speed play. Okay. okay. Um, so five minute warm up and then a two times 20 minute at 10K race pace. So this is where, like Larry was saying, you can break it up some in this case as well. Um, and Lisa, here we would have an active recovery in between. So five minute active recovery. So a light paddle in between reps. So we wouldn't completely stop. We would just um, paddle around lightly, but we still wanna keep that heart rate up during that 10K pace for that, those two 20 minute. Uh, sets. Victoria, then, mm -hmm. so sorry to interrupt. Um, just uh, like we're like we're you're talking a lot about racing right now or training, mm -hmm. you know, for racing. But I think we might have some people on here um, who have joined us today that aren't racers mm -hmm. and um, that really are just interested in you know using sub purely as a fitness uh, vehicle. Mm -hmm. What's the benefit of doing? this type of work or the, the anaerobic work, um, you know, the 20% of the time that isn't aerobic for the people that just want to um, train for fitness? Like what are the fitness benefits uh, of doing this kind of work? Like if it's not that much fun, why is it still a good idea for their fitness to do it? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, several reasons. First of all, it does, it does allow for a more cardiovascular benefit. Um, you're going to be pushing your heart more and you're going to make your heart more efficient. Um, so now your heart's getting stronger. It's able to not have to work as hard to supply your body with blood um, just in your everyday life, right? So now your heart's more efficient. These workouts also build strength, um, more strength because you're going harder, faster. You're using those different strength muscle fibers. So um, whereas in the gym, if you were to you know, go and do light, lightweight work, um, lots of reps. This would be similar to like, if you wanted to go a little bit of heavier weight, lower reps where you're getting a little more power. Um, so you're going to develop stronger muscles with these workouts. Um, and yeah, just your overall, I mean, it's going to make your, your aerobic work more efficient. So if you want to go out later than for a paddle, you know, cause you just want to comfortably, um, get a good hour paddle, you're going to see your times now getting a little bit faster, which is fun, even if you're not racing, um, just because then you can set your own little goals for yourself of, you know, like as if you were to go out for a run, like, oh, I'm going to do, you know, I'm doing um, 13 minute miles now. And then all of a sudden you're doing 12 and a half minute miles. So it kind of like makes you feel good and it keeps you going, you know? So these are the workouts that are going to actually help you increase that aerobic uh, pace. And they're going to burn a little bit uh, more calories per hour too, right? So that they'd help you with your body composition. Yeah. So you would, burn, yep. This is just like a high intensity interval training kind of work. Um, so you are going to be burning more calories. Um, same thing goes with, with strength training. You are going to be burning calories after more farther after you work out than um, aerobic work. So yeah, it's very similar in, in land work as well, but and yeah, I've, mm -hmm. I have found that this kind of training, you know, when when my interest in racing waned, this kind of training has been super super helpful for me in um, catching waves. Mm. You know, yep. having having this, this this kind of strength to to have fun catching waves, um, and definitely um, in trying to downwind. Um, cause there, there are times in downwinding where, you know, you're 
you're really resting, but then paddling really hard, and then resting and yeah. then paddling really hard. And and so this kind of stuff, um, you know, if, if those kinds of activities are something that you're interested in eventually doing, this is going to set you up really nicely for that as well. Yeah. And I apologize for the zoo that is my house. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you know, you're using different muscle fibers. So overall, your body's getting a more full um, benefit of the use of paddling for fitness, really. Um, so that would be a good reason if you weren't racing, which is totally fine, um, just to use your anaerobic systems. We want to use both, you know, just so we can get that full rounded fitness benefit of paddling. Which brings me actually to another benefit. <laughs> Um, so now that we've kind of talked about a little bit about our cardiovascular system, um, there are a ton of muscular fitness benefits for, from stand-up paddling. We have to put a lot of our, or we eventually want to put a lot of our weight on our muscles so that way we can propel our board forward more efficiently, faster. Um, Larry's going to chat about that more in the next couple of minutes, but um, there is a lot of muscle recruitment for power in stand-up paddling. Um, lower body, we're using a ton of. Upper body, we're using some of. So there's like a lot of muscle recruitment going all over our, our ankles, our flexing in different ways. We use a lot of little tiny muscles that we don't even know we have sometimes. So for people who are new and just getting into it, how you're like, oh man, my feet actually are sore afterwards. Um, Cause you're using your entire body. It's a whole body muscular fitness um, activity. It's kind of like, I like to look at it as like a complex strength training activity, um, kind of like Olympic lifting, how you're using like so much movement on your body. Um, muscular fitness wise, you're going to gain a lot of lean muscle mass and you're going to lose a lot of fat mass when you start using um, paddling as a fitness activity. Um, just because not only are you getting those cardiovascular benefits and losing the fat mass in that way, but now you're using your muscles to propel your board forward and to get that movement going. So you're building a lot of muscle. Actually, I, I don't think I could do a pull-up before I started paddle boarding. And I was always pretty strong, but I didn't have like that lat strength, you know, and then I started paddling and now I can do pull-ups. So, and that was all I did at first was just paddle. I didn't work out in the gym when I started. So it just shows that, wow, I gained like a lot of muscle in my back um, to be able to do a pull-up, right. Just from paddling, which is pretty cool. Um, same thing, like I said in a little bit ago, you're going to burn a lot more calories for a longer period of time after your workout. Um, there's also a possible increase in bone mineral density, high intensity exercise, especially when like when you're hitting or punching or running. I know we're not doing that in paddling, but um, there are there is a chance for bone mineral density increase. Um, and also with muscular fitness, there's going to be a greater recruitment of um, neuromuscular ad adaptation. So your neuromuscular system is going to be starting to develop a lot more, which is, which is awesome. You're going to put load on your muscles. The fibers are going to have to start firing around. You're going to recruit more and more neurons in there, and you're going to develop strength based off that. And you're going to get stronger based off that. Um, you're going to start building adapt adaptations to different resistances. And when that happens, you get stronger and now you can go even harder. Um, why do we want to do that if we're not racing similar as before, we want to be able to set those personal goals for ourselves. You know, when we have some sort of a fitness goal in mind, the, even if I just want to paddle to lose weight, um, the more efficient I can paddle, the more strong I can paddle, um, the more weight I'm going to lose because I'm going to be paddling more efficiently, right? I'm going to be getting a better workout, I guess you could say. Neurological benefits. Now this is, and Larry and I were chatting about this a lot. Um, it's such a cool thing. There's so many different studies out there on sports in general, really honestly, but um, paddling is, is really cool because it's ambidextrous. We have to use both sides or we want to use both sides equally. Um, and it kind of forces you to have to use both sides equally or to work on that weaker side. I really encourage people when they work with me um, we do a lot of different strength testing on one side or another, like grip strength test, um, and then developing that, that weaker side. Um, so in paddling, we want both sides to be equal. We want them to be equal in strength. We want them to be equal. We want to have equal control of our, our both limbs, um, and not just our upper limbs, but our lower limbs as well. Right? So with paddling, we know that 
not only do we have to move our both sides equally, hopefully, but we also have different things coming at us from both sides in different ways. So there might be a wave or there might be a wake. And so now your left foot has to flex a little or your, your, your neurological system is like going one way and then there's a wave that comes here and then you, you have to do something else with your arms. And so you're getting a lot of neurological movements going on and, and just recruitment going on through paddling just in general, right? Because we're not on a solid flat surface we're always moving so not only do we have to try to have this equal strength and control on both sides but now we got to do it on an uneven surface so we're definitely developing in that area um and the so the couple of things that we there's a lot of research based on these neurological benefits um with the exercise it actually increases your neuroplasticity which promotes neuron growth so throughout throughout your body throughout your brain um and in this i quoted this little this little study here that we read, there's, there's a strong uh, evidence that is associated with age-related hippocampal dysfunction. So in your brain, as we get older, we start developing things like dementia, um, memory impairment, risk of depression, and that's for all ages. Um, and so what they have found is that when you develop this hippocampal area, you're actually going to alleviate a lot of that. It's going to reduce depression. It's going to improve your memory. Um, you're going to actually build more a dense area within that area in your brain. So neurologically, when you're out there paddling, you're not just like paddling, you're actually developing your brain more, right? And as we age, we want to put our brain to use. We want to make sure that we're using every possible way that we can, because at a certain point, and in this study here, at a certain point, when you turn on this study in particular, it looked at um, adults older than 55 years of age without dementia. And you can see that this area in your brain, the hippocampus, which is good for learning and memory, it declined here. You, you see this large decline? It declined between one and 2% in people without dementia. So if we can find any way that we can to try to build this area of our brain up, through exercise and through paddling, why not, right? So it shows that by doing exercise, by doing paddling, by keeping involved in fitness in general, um, you're gonna increase your memory and you're gonna decrease your risk for dementia, basically. Um, and then I just, just really quick without getting into like crazy science stuff, but um, this, this one study here, and I just wanna show you that this study looked at, um, aerobic exercise. So even if you just literally went out there and paddled around aerobically and didn't do any of that anaerobic work that we talked about, this study looked at aerobic exercise versus um, flexibility or flex, like kind of like yoga stretching. Um, and it found that aerobic exercise training increased the size of the anterior part of your brain that I was just talking about, the hippocampus, um, and it, it improved your memory. And it increased the volume of that area of your brain by 2% reversing age-related loss in volume by one to two years by doing that aerobic exercise. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Um, and here you can see these participants, they just did it by walking for 10 minutes. They increased the duration of their walks until they got up to 40 minutes. Um, they did it over seven weeks and they walked for 40 minutes per session for the remainder of the, of the program. So they were just walking. Right. So imagine when you're doing all this other stuff, how how it might possibly increase that that area of your brain even more to hopefully decrease the the aging effects that happen to our brains uh, naturally. So I thought that was awesome. The target heart rate zone that they used in this study was 50 to 60 percent of their maximum heart rate. So you can see they were out there just doing an aerobic work. Um, and like I said, it was one it was one to seven weeks. So I thought that was awesome. Awesome. Very, very cool study. And just a, and just another great reason to get out there and use um, paddling as, as a tool for fitness because you are working different sides of your body. You're growing different parts of your brain. Um, you have to increase your memory. You're, in, you're learning new memory, um, which happens to decrease as we get older. Now we have to like learn how to use our left side when we've been using our right side more our whole life. Um, and you can. You know, it's all about learning different technique and putting that proper technique to work and you will learn how to use that other side of your body. So it's kind of fun too to learn like as you get older, you know, you think, oh, I kind of like already know how to do everything, right? 
but then you find something that you can actually learn something new with and do well at. Um, and it's just, it's just a really cool thing. So. And paneling is, is, is great because there are, you know, once you've maybe mastered just having fun on your local flat water lake, you know, there's, there's other kinds of paddling to try where you get to start expanding that learning all over again, whether it's, you know, subsurfing, downwinding, you know, easy whitewater, river supping. Um, you know, there's just all kinds of other ways to go and grow with, yeah. with, with sup. It doesn't have to just be, um, well, once I've learned how to stand up and paddle and turn around and, you know, maybe do a pivot turn, I'm done. You, right. You get you get to keep going and keep keep growing, not only the physical you know aspects, but also these mental aspects of it as well. Yeah, exactly. And you know, we want to we want to stay moving throughout our whole life. And the fact is that paddling is is very fun. Um, and obviously, as we chatted about, there's a ton of benefits. So if there's so much benefits in this great thing, like might as well do it, right? And it doesn't hurt when you fall, <laughs> unlike running or any any other land biking. Um, and lastly, but I just want to say is, is balance, obviously. Um, it does work on your balance. For those of us who don't have the greatest balance, you will develop a lot of balance within paddleboarding. We see all the time people that come out and they're new, they go on a paddleboard and they can hardly stand on it. With a little bit of work, they're standing, they're balancing, now they're paddling and they're going and we don't even see them until another hour, right? So um, why is increasing your balance important? Same thing as we age and stuff, we wanna make sure that we have good balance when we're walking around um, to prevent falls. I know it sounds goofy, but I worked in the MS field for a long time, falls are a real thing. Um, and it also works your smaller accessory muscles. So like I said before, your ankles are flexing, you have a lot of small muscles in your feet, um, your knees, what's going on there. Uh, so it works those accessory muscles that you might not hit in the gym or just doing these repetitive motions over and over. Um, so. Yeah, and it also works your strength unilaterally. Um, studies show that uh, force on power on average, it decreases by 29.5% on power output during exercises. So basically, if you are balancing, um, for an example, performance of resistance exercises while standing on a physio ball. So like you'll see a lot of people doing these exercises on those both two balls upside down. Um, it, de it improves stability and balance and it possibly improved um, strength and power. So a lot of times when you're training for these unilateral sports, um, especially on uneven surfaces, you can have benefit by doing it on these different um, unstable surfaces compared to stable surfaces. So, oh, that's Larry's slide. All right, so that was just a little bit about let me click off here. Um, that was just a little bit about what I had for you guys all for, for the fitness aspects of, of paddling. I hope you learned a little from my presentation on how you might be able to go out there and apply some of that to your workouts just to get that overall fitness benefit for your entire body system. Um, Larry is going to chat a little bit about how, how you can apply a different technique into your stroke so that way you're able to get the full benefits of the fitness we just talked about. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy. Awesome, thank you, Victoria. Um, yeah. And by the way, guys, like um, what I suggest is that um, if you have any questions, um, just uh, after this is over and we're not, you know, like live anymore, um, why don't you um, tomorrow, if you, or whenever you come up with the, the, the questions, just go to the Paddle Monster Facebook page and just um, and just put your question in there and we'll both check it for the next few days and we'll make sure that if you have a question based on anything that was discussed in this presentation that we'll answer it for you and everybody else there. Um, and uh, I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. I can't think of a better one at the moment, but um, yeah. So let's uh, move along so that we can um, get on with our evenings uh, at some point. I'm afraid I'm going to talk for a long time, so I'll try to keep it uh, brief. Um, I want to talk about uh, technique. I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint too, just because it keeps me on track and it can help give you something to look at as well. So uh, I'm going to share a screen here. And um, uh, I guess that's me, right? Um, so um, 
let me just make it in the screen view, presentation view. Here we go. Okay, so um, I think the important thing is here, like I want to talk to you about how technique and, and paddling well, good, good paddling technique can make your workouts better. So Victoria talked about the different types of workouts that you can do, aerobic, anaerobic, lactate threshold. Um, and uh, she gave you some examples of some of the workouts and she told, she described really well why, um, you know, stand up paddling is a great fitness activity. Um, but the reality is that you're gonna get a better workout you, you go actually get a better workout. You'll be able to work harder for longer um, if you paddle well. Um, and it's also gonna be a more enjoyable experience for you. Um, so, you know, technique and learning to paddle better is a really worthwhile investment, even if you're not planning on racing. And so um, for the purposes of, of this group and, and, and um, fitness, uh, a sup, using SUP for fitness, I think technique can be broken into three areas. The first is stability. What things can you do with your technique to enhance your stability? Um, steering, what things can you do with your technique to allow you to track your board straighter? Um, and then obviously the forward stroke so that you can work you know, harder and hit your, your target training zones, that type of thing. Obviously stability um, I think is important because um, like Lisa's talking about, it'll, if, if the more stable you are, the more confidence you're gonna have. To getting, uh, you know, being able to do your workout in a variety of weather conditions, whether it's wind, whether it's little waves, wave, big waves, current, whatever. Um, steering or tracking your board straight is hugely important because if you're constantly having to change sides just to keep your board going straight, you're not going to be uh, able to work as hard as if you can paddle for a, a considerable period of time, maybe even an, an indefinite period of time on one side. Um, and then obviously too, when we just look at, at a forward paddling stroke, we want to make sure that we're able to, you know, use the big muscles, uh, that Victoria was talking about properly, because if we're not using them, um, we're not training them. Right. So spending a little time in each of these areas can really improve your workout. Um, so with regards to stability, I'll go through this fairly quickly. When it comes to steering, I'm actually going to get up and demonstrate a few things. And then with technique, uh, the forward stroke, we're going to look at a, at a video of a guy paddling and uh, talk about technique there. And then I'll show you some drills that you can do on land, um, either in your home in front of a full length mirror or um, on you know, the land before you get in the water that will really enhance your ability to, to paddle the way you want to in the water. I know it sounds crazy, but it really works. So I'll explain that when we get there. Um, as far as stability is concerned, the most important thing is to trust your paddle. Your paddle is your best friend. Um, when I first started paddling canoe, the coach said, your paddle is your best friend. Don't ever let go of your paddle. And I quickly found out why, because I let go of my paddle and I fell in the water instantly. So your paddle is two things for your stability. The first is just having it in your hands gives you balance, right? It's a big, long, essentially like a long pole. And it's pretty analogous to when you see the tightrope walker walking along and they've got that long, long pole that helps give them balance, right? That the length of the pool helps allow them uh, to make the better make the little adjustments that allow them to maintain balance. So your paddle is doing that for you when it's in your hands and not in the water. And then when it's in the water, it's giving you support. You can actually lean on it. And I'm sure that most people are familiar with the idea of bracing where you can slap the paddle down in the water if you're losing your balance and it will support you. But um, something that most people don't think about is that when you reach forward and you gather water in the blade as it goes in the water, it's now supporting you in the same way that your brace out to the side supports you. And so, you know, the, uh, when you put your blade in the water, gather water on the face of the blade and are getting ready to pull, you're actually bracing. You could call it a power brace if you want to, but it gives you something to lean on. It supports your body weight. And so it helps you with your stability. And if you've ever dropped your paddle when you're on your board and you don't have it in your hands anymore, you'll realize how less stable you are, especially if you're in rougher water. So the, the paddle is really important. The other thing that's really important is understanding the stability characteristics of your board. And there's two different types of stability built into your board. 
The first is the primary stability, and that's the amount that the board twitches or jitters underneath you, right? And then the secondary stability is where is how far the board will actually go before it actually stops rolling over to the side, right? So um, it's a good idea. I mean, your board is your board. Most of us may only have one board that, you know, that we own, so we're stuck with what we have. Um, the idea then to be stable so that you can be confident in your stability so that you can get good workouts in is to spend some time learning what the stability characteristics of your board are. So get on your board and start to sort of, you know, feel how twitchy it is and actually get used to it twitching. Like actually try to make it twitch and get used to it twitching because the more it twitches, the more comfortable, comfortable you become with that sensation occurring underneath you and the less it's going to throw you off when you're paddling. And ultimately you want to get to a point where you can let the board wobble underneath you and just let it twitch while you are perfectly stable rather than every time the board twitches or wobbles, you're wobbling with it, right? And the only way that that's really achievable is by understanding and playing with and getting to know where the prime, what the primary stability of your board's like. And then the second thing you want to do, and you may want to wait until it's a little warmer than this, I suppose, because you know, you could go too far and fall in and falling in is never a bad thing when you're learning about the stability of board because it helps you find where the limits are. But test out the secondary stability, let the board, you know, let actually let it go over and kind of actually try to push it over. And initially, it's going to move to one side really pretty quickly, but it's going to slow down and it's going to stop. Right. Eventually, you'll reach a point where there's resistance to the board continuing to, to tip over. And that point is where the secondary stability of your board is. And once you understand where the secondary stability of the board is, it gives you a lot of confidence for letting the board wobble underneath you because you know that these little twitches are really nothing at all because you know, you're well within the margins of your secondary stability. And that when you reach a point, even when you feel like it's going a long way, eventually it's gonna stop, right? And what usually happens to people when they fall off their paddle board is not that the, they pass the point of secondary stability and the board flipped over. Usually what happens is they're unfamiliar with the secondary stability of the board. The board starts to tilt and they start to panic and they actually jump off rather than just staying calm and staying in the middle of the board and paddling and letting the board reach secondary stability, stop and then come back, right? So, so that's uh, just a couple of little tips that you can have uh, that you should do to really enhance your stability. There's a couple more. Hey, Larry, before you go on to those, we've got a great question from Chris. Okay. And he asks, are beginner boards typically built more for primary stability and performance board built boards built more for secondary stability? That's a good question. I would, if I had to guess, I would say that beginner boards have much more, um, primary stability. They're not nearly as twitchy. They're usually, they're usually wider. Uh, they usually have a flatter bottom. Um, and so they're going to be much less twitchy. Um, with regards to the secondary stability, I think you, you have to kind of find out where it is in your board. Um, I can't, I wouldn't want to speak to that necessarily. But would, would, would a performance board, like say your race board, your, yeah, your well, starboard sprint, is that going to have a uh, Better uh, secondary stability. Yeah, well, I mean, again, with a race board, it, de it depends on the board. Right. Um, some of them are surprisingly solid in terms of their primary stability, but some of them are quite twitchy. So this morning was only the second time this year that I took my, uh, my sprint out, and it's 19.75 inches wide. It's super narrow. And it was really twitchy the first, uh, you know, kilometer or so. Um, until I got used to it and was able to control the twitches a little bit better. But it has really high, it's a dugout with really high sidewalls on it. And it has amazing secondary stability. So, you know, it depends on the board, but I would say in general as, as performance boards, you know, they're starting to get narrower. And the narrower the board in general, probably the twitchier it's gonna be. So the less primary stability it's gonna have, but a good, like a well-designed, uh, performance board is probably going to have pretty good secondary stability so that you can paddle and let it twitch underneath you and you're confident that when it starts to go it's going to stop right 
especially if you're using it in rough water. That's really a nice feeling to know that it's going to stop. Um, one of the, you know, that sort of takes care of the equipment, you know, what to do with our paddle and, and the characteristics of our board. When it comes to how you're paddling, there's some, some things that you can do for your stability as well. The first is to focus on your paddling rhythm. So the better uh, rhythm that you can get into, the more consistent your rhythm can be, um, the more stable you're going to feel. Um, and so um, sometimes it seems counterintuitive, but the more tentative you are, in fact, the more concerned about your balance you are and the less you're moving, um, you know, the, like the less rhythmically you're moving, um, usually the less stable you actually are. So for stability, often it's a case of, of teaching yourself to sort of throw caution to the wind and not tense up or be tentative and actually get into a nice paddling rhythm and maintain that paddling rhythm. Making sure that you're, when you're, your blade goes in the water that you can feel it supporting your body weight and keeping good pressure of the blade against the water through the stroke so that you may maintain a connection that's going to be supporting you through the stroke and then being fairly quick in the air, getting back to the next stroke, right? That's gonna make, give you a little bit more uh, stability. And I've always found too that focusing on my rhythm and how my body's moving helps me avoid focusing on how my board's twitching underneath me. And it's amazing that if you can focus on something other than the twitchiness, suddenly the twitchiness doesn't bother you, okay? Um, sort of going along with that is the suggestion to try to move your body more and not less. So like I said, a natural instinct that people have when they get into rough water is to tense up a bit. So they tense up a bit and um, when they do, they, they, everything kind of tightens up and they stand still on their board and stiff on their board. And almost when you see somebody really tensed up on their board, it's almost like they become a pole on their board and almost like the mast in a sailboat. And if you've ever stood on a pier or a jetty and watch the sailboat come in to the harbor from the rough water, you'll see that this, as the sailboat rocks back and forth, the mast is rocking back and forth too. And so you don't want to tense up to the point that you become like the mast in a sailboat. So when the board leans, you're tense, you're leaning with it too. The more relaxed you can be, um, the more you can focus on your paddling rhythm, the more likely it is that the board's going to wobble underneath you and you're just going to absorb the wobbles and you're going to keep your body fairly straight and level. And I've always found that, that you know, it's really helpful to, in, in order to resist the urge to tense up, to think about moving more. So using your legs more, using your hips more, using your body more, getting a little deeper under the water. Uh, with your upper body, like getting the paddle deeper in the water by going down with your upper body a little bit more. And if you can do those things, it, 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 A, it prevents you from tensing up and B, it ensures that you have a really good connection with the water, which remember is the blade's going to support you. Um, and it helps you um, not focus on the twitchy wobbly board and it helps you focus on, focus on your rhythm. And you end up letting the board wobble un underneath you without you wobbling with the board. Um, not being afraid to fall in is an important part of learning. Um, obviously, if you're in my part of the world, it's a little bit early to not worry about falling in. Um, but as the warmer weather comes, you should you know, push your limits a little bit with regards to knowing where your stability is, with regards to you know, trying to have that full movement stroke when you feel like your balance challenge. Um, and if you embrace that learning process, um, your stability is going to improve over time really quickly. And Victoria alluded, it, alluded to it when she talked about balance in her part of the presentation, saying that, it, you know, people who are willing to sort of commit to that learning process, you know, one week they'll be all, they'll be new and they'll be very cautious. And the next week they're off paddling out of sight because they feel um, they feel pretty stable. So, um, and even if you're on a narrow board, um, if you're willing to invest the time in learning how to, you know, to practice your stability, um, you'll be, you, you'll be able to master that too. It's just a question of spending the time doing it. So 
Um, there's lots more uh, information on stability on our site, uh, paddlemonster.com. There's videos and there's also uh, you know written posts on it. So I invite you to to look at that if if uh, if you want. But um, those are just some tips for stability, little technique things that you can use for stability um, that are going to help you. There's one more thing that I didn't add there, and that's simply to get lower, right? Um, the, the, the taller you're standing on your board, um, the higher your center of mass is. And the higher your center of mass is, the easier it is for it to get outside the base of support, which is that's when you, you know, when the center of mass gets outside the base of support, that tends to be when you lose your balance. So if you can get a little lower, it gets your center of mass a little bit lower, and uh, that's going to give you some stability too. And the way to get lower on a paddle board is, is to bend your legs a bit more. And I'll be talking about that more when we start looking at the forward stroke. Um, with regards to steering, uh, I'm going to get up and demonstrate a couple of uh, steering tools in a second, but tracking straight allows you to simply to do more strokes on one side without having to change sides to steer. And that really allows you to work your muscles longer on each side before you have to do a side change. It's kind of like doing uh, more reps in an exercise in the gym, right? You can, you can work your muscles. Uh, if you're trying to build power endurance and Victoria talked about that you can you know you need to do higher rep weights in a gym and if if you want to build power endurance in your paddling um, it's good if you can do more reps on one side before having to change sides um, generally speaking too when we change sides um, we tend to break our paddling rhythm a bit uh, we tend to pull most people uh, unless they're really good at side changes tend to have a like an easier stroke before they change sides and the, the next stroke after they change sides is a little bit easier too. A good side change takes a lot of practice. Um, but, you know, if you're taking that, those two strokes, you know, and not putting everything into them, every five strokes or every 10 strokes, um, those are a lot of strokes that you're losing in terms of not being full on strokes. Um, but if you can paddle, for 30 strokes on a side or 40 strokes on a side or indefinitely on one side, and it's all possible, um, it really enhances your ability to get a good cardio workout too, okay? So um, steering's really important and um, uh, it can really enhance uh, your uh, workout. So let me um, get up for a second and go to the other room, grab a paddle, and I'll show you uh, three steering techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference. Um, so let me stop uh, this share for a second. I'll put the PowerPoint aside for a second and I'll uh, go to the other room here. And I'll turn on the light because it got dark. All right. Can you guys see me okay? Maybe move back just a little bit more. Hey, I'm going to move back. Can, can you see me okay? Yeah. Okay. So the first, the first uh, steering tip or steering tool is simply called paddling close to the rail or the side of your board. Okay. And um, so the way we want to do that, most people, if they're, uh, they lack confidence in, in the blades supporting their body weight, are going to keep their, their weight inside the rail of the board. And they're going to paddle like this with their top hand inside the board, their, bot, their, their, bot, their bottom hand, you know, over the rail and they'll paddle a greater distance from the side of the board because of that, right? And so if you think about it, the further your paddle blade is from the center line of the board, the more likely it is to create a turning effect to the opposite side. So what you want to do is you want to try to bring that blade instead of being a greater distance from the edge of the board, you want to bring it as close to the edge of the board as possible. So you want to try to have a paddle that, if seen from in front or behind, looks like it's vertical, like this, not like that, okay? But the way to do that is not to keep your body inside the board and move your top hand across your face to do it. Because that puts your shoulder, your top shoulder, your top arm, in a very weak position and it puts your shoulder in a compromising position where it risks injury. So instead what you want to do, and it, the, the third thing is it keeps all your body weight inside your board. 
and we'll talk about body weight when we start with the forward stroke, but that's not a recipe for good paddling. So we want to try to get our weight out over the water and onto our paddle. And so what we're going to do is we're going to lean a little bit out over the water. So paddling side. Board. Can you guys hear me okay? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Like, okay, I just hear a lot of rustling around on the feed, so. Okay. The video seems to be cutting out a little bit. So, you want to be out over the water a bit. You want to have your head over your shoulder, and you kind of want to have your top shoulder over your bottom shoulder as well. You kind of want to try to be like that. So your upper body's kind of hanging over the water. Okay. Um, and this is where getting to know the stability of your board is really handy because if you're uncertain of it, you're going to be reluctant to get out over the water like that. You just try to keep your weight evenly dispersed between your feet and try to get your head over your shoulders and your top your head over shoulder and your top shoulder as close to you over your bottom shoulder as possible. We call this shoulder stacked. Okay. And then enter the water there and pull straight along the rail of your board. All that is going to do is it's going to minimize the turning effect of each stroke and it's going to help you stay on one side without having to change sides to steer for a longer period of time. It's going to minimize the amount that you turn. Okay. The second thing <clears throat> that we can do is we can use our feet to steer and we can use our feet to steer by weighting the opposite rail of the board okay so our boards um when we're paddling they're different than it's different than surfing um when you're doing your forward paddling when you're surfing or when you're riding a skateboard or a snowboard generally what you do is you weight the uh, you, you weight the side to which you want to turn. So if I want to turn right, I'm going to weight the right side and I will turn to the right. When we're on our board in the middle of our board and we're paddling along, if we weight the opposite rail a little bit, right, then that actually helps us turn towards the paddling side. Okay. Um, and so if we can just kind of weight the opposite rail a bit, the way I find easiest is just to practice standing on land and practice putting more weight on one leg than the other, right? So when you're standing at attention, weight is evenly dispersed between your two feet. When you stand kind of like, like you're cool, you go all your weight on one foot and very little weight in the other. Just stand like that and you practice standing like that on your board and weighting one rail, right? And then paddling, close to the rail while you're doing that. So you, you're using the first skill paddling close to the rail now in combination with weighting the opposite rail. And it's gonna help you turn towards the paddle. And then when you get comfortable with it, you can act with those two skills. You can actually see that if you weight the opposite rail, right? It makes your, your opposite rail go down and it makes the rail on the paddling side come up a bit. And it actually helps expose the underside of your board a bit. So now what you can do is you can actually, instead of just paddling close to the rail, you can actually, when you get confident with it, you can get outside the rail a little bit with your top hand and with your head, and you can actually paddle under the rail or under the board if you need to, and you're paddling even closer to the center line now, and that even further reduces the turning effect. So you can, you know, you can go from paddling close to the rail and if you need to make an adjustment to bring the board to the paddling side, you can actually go under the rail of the board. And then the third skill is called drawing the nose of the board or bringing the nose, pulling the nose of the board to the paddle. And the way you do that is normally when you put your blade in the water, if this is the, if this book, is the rail of the board, your paddle is going in like that, perpendicular to the side of the board or the rail of the board, and it's pulling straight back. That's what's going to give you the most forward propulsion. But in, in order to draw the nose, what we do is we open our paddle to the side of the board a little bit 
as the blade goes in the water and gathers water in the blade and as we start our pull. And when we do that, enter the water like that and water loads up on the face of the blade, it pulls the board to the paddle a little bit at the front of the stroke. And then once the blade's buried and we start to pull, we can straighten our blade and pull straight back. Okay, so we actually pull the nose over a little bit and you can practice standing on your board. And I don't know if you can see my paddle blade, but opening up your paddle blade a little bit as you put it in the water and just going in and putting it in the water and pulling the nose over to the paddle. You just practice that while you're standing still and you'll see that you can pull the nose over. So then when you're doing your forward stroke, you can go in the water and you can just go in the water with the blade ever so slightly open to the board, put it in the water, pull the nose a bit at the front of the stroke and then straighten your blade and pull straight back. Okay, and that helps you bring the board to the paddle inside. And if you use these three skills together, they're really powerful. And you can get to a point if you practice it where you can actually bring your steer your board to the paddle inside without having to change to the opposite side. Okay, so that's how powerful they are. And um, it, it takes practice, but um, but that's. Uh, those are the skills that you want to use for steering your board, the techniques you want to use for steering your board. And um, if you want to see these in more detail, um, I invite you to go either to uh, the website, paddlemonster.com, or go to our YouTube channel. And there's a bunch of videos um, on tracking your board straight um, that I did um, in 2020, April 2021. COVID first hit and everything was locked down. Um, so I did some videos that I wanted to keep people engaged and, and I had nothing else to do because I couldn't paddle. So I did these videos and um, they're available and I go through each skill separately. Um, and then kind of a bringing it all together thing where I show some drills that you can do uh, using these skills to improve your steering. But just using those skills is really gonna augment your ability to use stand-up paddling as a fitness tool because it's gonna make uh, your, uh, it's gonna really enhance your ability to work, right? To, to get into the training zones that uh, Victoria was talking about. All right, so um, I'm just going to uh, now bring you up to speed on, um, on, uh, on the forward stroke, te technique in the forward stroke. So let's, I'm briefly going to share a PowerPoint with you and then we're going to look at some videos. So let me uh, share this with you. All right, so you guys uh, uh, can see my PowerPoint again. Um, all right, so just when it comes to a forward stroke, um, I just want to emphasize that we're all different shapes and sizes. Um, and um, uh, you know, we all have different physical strengths and weaknesses. And so it's unrealistic to expect that every single person is going to look the same when they're paddling. And the fact that two people don't look the same doesn't mean that one paddles poorly and the other paddles well. Um, it's just that there, there are two different bodies with two different skill, uh, physical uh, toolkits trying to, to move their board effect, effectively through the water. And because they're different, they're going to end up looking different when they do it. Um, but the thing that I found is that there are six fundamental things that we're trying to do with our technique, with our paddle, um, and with our body to, uh, to move our board efficiently through the water. Um, it's that how it ends up looking as we do it that makes a, us look like we paddle differently. Um, and virtually everyone I've ever done a clinic with, any of the pros I've ever done a, a clinic with, have all agreed with these, these fundamentals. And they, they really kind of cross paddle disciplines because they apply to sprint canoe, they apply to outrigger, they apply to, to kayak, uh, they apply to uh, dragon boat, uh, they apply to stand up paddling. And so the first is simply that when we're trying to paddle, what we're doing is we're not pulling the paddle through the water. We're actually putting the paddle in the water, gathering water in the face of the blade, holding it there, pulling ourselves to the paddle, and then pushing ourselves past the paddle. That's what moves our board forward through the water. The second thing is that when we're doing that, 
we want to try to use big muscles preferentially over small muscles. So we want to try to use the muscles of our legs, our hips, uh, our core. Um, we want to use them more than we want to use the muscles of our arms. And even to an extent, the muscles of our upper body, which though bigger than the muscles of our arms, are smaller than the muscles in our legs, the muscles across our hips, and the muscles in our core. We want to try to use our body weight as much as possible. Our, using our body weight takes body weight off of the board. It makes the board a little, a little higher in the water and allows it to, it therefore has less resistance to forward movement across the water than it does if it's sitting deeper in the water. So it's easier to move across the water. And then the other thing is that if we get our body weight off the board and onto the paddle, we can use gravity acting on our body weight to create a force that we can use in addition to the force that we're exerting with our muscles to uh, work against the water that we have loaded on our paddle blade. Um, we want to do as much as we possibly can with positive blade angle. And positive blade angle is when the blade goes in the water and it's, it's going in like this, that's positive blade angle. And then as we start to pull, it gets to vertical. So we want to do as much as we can from positive to near vertical and just past vertical. But once the blade passes vertical and gets increasingly negative, it's doing us less uh, service and moving our board forward. So we like to get it out of the water and get back to the next stroke where we, where we have a positive blade angle. Um, so we want to try to maximize the amount of time the blade's positive or close to vertical, minimize the amount of time that it's negative. We want to do things that maximize the run of the board between strokes. And the biggest thing there is really make sure that we do a good job of pushing ourselves past the paddle at the end of the stroke. And then lastly, we want to have economy of motion. We don't want to have a lot of unnecessary movements when we're paddling. We want our movements to be pretty compact and we want them to be fairly direct. You know, we don't, if, if we're talking about taking the paddle of the water and reaching forward for the next stroke, we want that to be a fairly direct movement. We don't want it to be a big swingy loopy motion. The reason is because first of all, that big swingy loopy motion takes more time. And then the second thing is that it also takes more energy than a quick direct motion would take. Um, so, um, and then just before I get up and demonstrate, <coughs> um, or just sorry, just before we watch the video, um, it's useful to just get some uh, terminology down too, because I'm gonna be talking about um, uh, some terminology when we look at the stroke in, in terms of the phases of the stroke or the parts of the stroke. And so the most commonly, most commonly used terms for describing the stroke are the setup, where your, your blade's up in front of you. You look like you're all ready to put the blade in the water, but it's not quite in the water yet. And then the entry or the catch, where the blade goes in the water, water gathers and loads up on the face of the blade. The pull, where we start to work against the water that we have on the blade. The exit, where we bring the paddle out of the water. And then the recovery, where we move through the air to the next setup. Um, those are the terms you're probably going to uh, hear to describe the, phase, uh, the phases of the stroke the most. I also like to look at it differently, um, and I, I, I like to refer to it often as the setup, um, the entry or the gathering, and then loading, which is sort of the whole pulling phase, and then unloading, which is kind of uh, the end of the pulling phase and the, and the exiting, and then the recovery. And uh, when we look at the video, you'll see why I talk about loading and unloading. And then the last thing I want to talk about before we get to the video um, is going to be um, the idea of connection. You'll hear me talk a lot about connection. And connection is basically um, your ability to gather water on your blade and hold it there. And the degree to which you're able to pull yourself to the paddle and push yourself past it without the blade slipping through the water and losing you losing grip against the water. It's kind of like connection is kind of like traction in your car, you know, with your wheels on the pavement or like your feet, if you're walking in beach sand or snow, right? Like versus walking on pavement. So when you walk on pavement, your foot hits the ground and it, you go to push off on the pavement and there's no slippage. But in beach sand or snow, your foot goes into the sand you start to push in the sand and some of the sand gives way under your under foot and your foot kind of slides without pushing you forward. So that would represent, you know, connection on the pavement and a loss of connection in the sand. 
So if we think of connection, when you hear me talk about connection, it's the paddle connected to the water, which is a, 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 gonna determine the degree to which we're able to pull ourselves through the paddle and push ourselves past the paddle, rather than pulling the paddle through the water and our board not moving anywhere, okay? So let me call up a video of a guy that's paddling and he's a really good exemplar uh, that we can use here. Um, just make sure I've got him open on my desktop. I do, okay, so I'm gonna share him with you. Here he is. So this is a guy, he lives in Ireland. Uh, can you guys see a nice harbor here? Just somebody just- Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, okay, yes. okay, so this is a guy that uh, I've been working with. He's from Ireland and um, he, I'm using him as an example because he paddles well. Um, and, but he kind of represents every person. Like he's not a pro. Um, he's in his mid to late thirties. He's a family man. He's got kids. He's got a job. So he paddles when he can after work, when, you know, family duties and whatnot, uh, don't get in the way. And, um, um, you know, I think through the winter he was paddling, you know, once or twice a week. And in the summer, he paddles a bit more because he actually does some uh, sup instruction. But, um, you know, like I said, he's not a pro. And um, he didn't paddle as well as he's gonna, you're gonna see him paddling here when we started working together. And this represents about six or seven weeks into working together. And, and I really like what he's doing. And, um, and I'll explain to you what he's doing well and why I like it and why I think it's a good technique uh, and why these are good things to think about um, to accomplish those six fundamentals and why paddling like this would give you a better workout, okay? So let's bring him into frame. And here he is. So I'm going to just uh, advance him frame by frame here. And the first thing I wanna talk about is his stance. Okay, so um, you'll recall when we were talking about stability, uh, it, it helps to be, you know, a little bit lower. Um, that comes from having your knees bent. Um, and also with, with your knees bent, you're not um, standing perfectly up straight like the mast on a sailboat, like you don't become a pole on your board. Um, the other thing is that contrast this, just what we see here, to what you see in those television commercials that are using people on stand-up paddle boards. Right? There's all kinds of products now that have for some reason determined that it's cool to at the end of the commercial have a little scene where they've got a couple of people on stand up paddle boards. I can think of, you know, like the, the, um, uh, the resorts, the Caribbean resorts, they have people on stand up paddle boards for the commercials, a lot of like health products, nutritional products, whatever, they'll have people out paddling on paddle boards. A lot of times they don't even have their paddle the right way around. Um, but they're standing up straight and they're mostly just paddling with their arms. And the truth of the matter is that paddling like that, they're not going to be able to get their heart uh, rate in the training zones that, or reach the level of perceived exertion that Victoria was talking about. So you, you have to, 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 to start from an entirely different stance before you do anything else. And so the stance that I like is the stance that we see this guy doing right here. You'll notice that his knees are bent slightly. You'll also notice that his ankles are bent. And Victoria talked a lot about, uh, when she's talking about you know, muscles, she talked about small muscles in your feet and in your ankles. So he's got a lot of ankle flexion here. He's, his knees are you know, comfortably bent, not extremely bent, but comfortably bent. If you had to guess where his center of mass was right here, you'd probably guess that it was slightly in front of his body because it kind of looks like he's leaning forward right from his feet, right? And you can see almost that the angle from his ankle to his knees is pretty similar to the angle from his hips to his head. He kind of looks like a little lightning bolt here, right? And so he's actually leaning forward right from his feet. And the benefit of that for paddling is that um, it's going to help him do two things. The first is it's going to help him get his, when he reaches forward to put his blade in the water, it's gonna help him get his blade buried more quickly because 
his center mass is slightly in front of his feet. So he's inherently a little bit unstable in a forward direction. Um, if his paddle doesn't get in the water as he starts to reach out in front of him, if his paddle doesn't get in the water quickly, he's gonna topple onto the deck of his board or maybe do a face plant in the water. But we know when we're talking about stability that once that blade goes in the water and loads some water up on it, that it will give him something to lean on. It will give him a bit of support. So it's gonna encourage him to get the blade very quickly. The second thing is <clears throat> by being in this leaning forward from his feet position with lots of ankle flexion, almost as if he's wearing ski boots, right? Um, it's gonna help him get body weight on his paddle instantly as the blade gets buried in the water. Rather than if he was standing up straight or if he had, had didn't have ankle flexion and was bending his knees by sticking his butt out behind him. Like there's two ways that you can bend your knees. One is by bending your ankles to bend your knees. I'll demonstrate that in a second. And the other is by um, uh, not getting so much ankle flexion, but sort of sticking your butt out behind you like you're about to sit in a chair, right? Um, that isn't as good because when you stick your butt out behind you, it keeps your weight balanced over your feet. But when you have ankle flexion, you get your knees over your toes and you try to use your glutes to squeeze your glutes to keep your hips forward. And if you look at his bum, you can see it's kind of level or just forward of his heels. That means that his weight is staying in front of his feet. And it means that he's going to get weight on his blade as soon as the blade goes in the water. Okay. So that's sort of what we want to do in our stance, right? We want to be kind of leaning forward just a little bit from our feet with lots of ankle flexion, our knees slightly bent, and our hips forward if we can, rather than a bum sticking out behind us. And then as we reach forward, right, as we go towards our setup, we wanna maintain that position with our lower body. We wanna keep our hips forward, maintain our ankle flexion, and we wanna reach with our bottom hand, and we wanna keep reaching with our bottom hand. We want that bottom arm to get nice and straight out in front of us. And we'll, we want the angle be underneath be, our arm, between our arm and our body, we want that angle to really open up so that we're kind of exposing our, our, our upper lat to the water. And we wanna to try to hold that rotation, to hold that reach with our bottom hand while the blade goes in the water. You can see the tip of his paddle is just about to, is just contacting the water here. And watch what a good job he does of getting his blade buried quickly. And you can see as he's doing that, his hand is still kind of reaching as his blade goes in the water. I call it reaching to catch. He's holding his hand forward. In, in contrast to what a lot of people do is they'll, their hand will come as it goes down to get the blade in the water, it's also moving back. And so they'll lose a lot of blade angle getting the blade in the water and their blade will travel say from here all the way back to here and be very nearly vertical by the time it's buried right, if they pull to catch. But you'll see he holds that hand forward and he gets the blade in the water very quickly with a positive blade angle. And you can see how much load he has on his paddle right here by how much the shaft of his paddle is flexing. Okay, so he's doing a really good job of getting his blade very quickly. He's got a really nice load now. You'll also see that as he did it, he kept his hips pretty forward, but he did bend his knees a little bit to help him get the blade in the water. You can see he's bent his knees a little bit more. His hips have come back ever so little, but not a lot. He's kept his blade angle, <clears throat> but now that his blade's set and buried, okay, he's finished the gathering, the catch. Now he's gonna start the pull, or he's gonna continue to load body weight and power onto the paddle, okay? And just watch where it comes from, okay? Just watch this part of his body, legs, and watch his, the direction his hips move back. Just watch. See how he kind of crouches down and gets lower, how his legs bend and his butt moves back, his hips thrust back. Look at where his hips were here. And if you kind of draw an imaginary line, from the back of his bum down to his heels, 
they're about level. And you can see the degree of leg bend that he has. But when you look to see where he is, when he's finished his pull, he's now got a real gap between the back of his butt and his heels. So he's driven back with his hip and his legs have bent a lot. So he's really used in the pull, his hips and all the big muscles that cross his hips, his legs, because his legs have bent a lot. And he's also, because he's bent at the waist, he's used a lot of his core muscles as well. Kind of like he's almost doing a crunch on top of the paddle. Surprisingly, the muscles he, he hasn't used at all are his arms because his arm has stayed pretty much straight the whole stroke, right? It only starts to bend just at the end of the stroke here. It starts to bend a little bit and that's okay. If anything, that's just helping him keep blade angle. What he hasn't done is he hasn't pulled with his bicep like this. And if you look at his top arm, it's staying the same angle the whole time. He's not entering the water like this and then punching with his top hand as he pulls through the water. So he's not using his triceps on his upper arm or his biceps on his lower arm. His arms are, are essentially connectors. All they're doing, they're, they're toning, they're flexing. He's working his arms, but he's not using them to create power that's working against the water loaded on his paddle to drive his board forward. He's just using them to connect the water that he has gathered on the face of his blade to these big muscles in this part of his body, okay? Um, and even, quite frankly, not just his arms, but this part of his back, his lats, they're more or less connectors as well, right? If you watch, he's not really pulling with his lats that much. They're just tensed up so that they can, they can transmit the, the, or link the water loaded on his blade to the, uh, to the muscles that are doing all the work or transmit the force that all these muscles are doing to the water loaded on the blade. And that's resulting in his blade moving forward. So he's doing a really good job. If you think of those fundamentals, he's done a really good job of uh, getting the blade very quickly. So he's doing a lot with positive blade angle, right? And he does a good job right here, doing a lot of good stuff with using uh, all his big muscles in his body weight with a blade that's positive blade angle or very, you know, he's spending a lot of time with it close to vertical. Um, he's using his body weight. His body weight is, you know, forward here. So he's getting body weight on the blade right away at the catch. And then as he's continuing to climb on top of his paddle through this part of his stroke, he's continuing to pile on body weight. So he's using his body weight, his big muscles. Um, his movements are pretty direct as we'll see when we look at the exit and we'll look to see in a second here um, uh, how well he makes the board run between strokes, okay? Um, but all of this I like to talk about is the loading phase. So he, he, he gathers water on his face of blade and he loads body weight and force generated by big muscles onto the blade. And he gets to this point where his blades just pass vertical and you can still see how much connection he has, how much force he's exerting because of that bend in his shaft. His top hand's basically in front of his face, or in front of his forehead. His blade is just passed through vertical and still in front of his feet. And you can see here now, he doesn't go down anymore. Like his legs aren't bending anymore. His hips aren't driving back anymore. And he's not bending at the waist anymore. He's not getting any lower with his back. He's at this point, he's finished loading. So now what he needs to do is immediately start to unload. And the biggest mistake that people make at this point is they get stuck down here in this position and their hands move. They stay bent over like this and this hand will move down to here and this hand will move back to here and the blade angle will move very negative with him staying down. And so you get to a point where you have this spot in the stroke where the only thing moving the paddle is your hands. And the paddle is going from a pretty much vertical blade angle to an increasingly negative angle. And there's no longer any big muscles engaged in, in the stroke, okay? 
Um, but the reason I like what he's doing so much is not just what I've shown you so far at the front of the stroke, but what he's about to do now. He's finished loading and watch what happens. Immediately, he begins to unload. And by unloading, I mean, he's gonna to start to come up. And I want you to pay close attention to how he's coming up, okay? Watch his hips and his legs. His hips are going to come forward underneath his body and his legs are gonna straighten back to their original degree of bend, okay? Just watch, you can see his hips are already starting to move forward. The gap between the back of his butt and his heels has closed. His hips have, uh, sorry, his legs have straightened close to their degree of original bend. And what's making it look like he's coming up with his head and sh shoulders is the fact that his hips are coming underneath his body. Okay. Um, and so that's making it look like he stood up. Um, and so that's the key to getting this, to pushing yourself past the paddle is using the big muscles across your hips um, by bringing them towards the paddle, straightening your legs back to their original bend. So it's like he's almost doing a portion of a squat as he's straightening his legs and he's doing it against the water that he still has gathered in his blade, right? And he's trying to minimize what he's doing with the tiny muscles at the base of his back, which are more for posture than big force producing muscles like the muscles across his hips, okay? And then you can see, so he's bringing his hips forward and bringing his hips forward is what initiates, once the blade gets to his feet, the blade popping out of the water. And you can see the blade pops out of the water pretty quickly. He now bends his bottom arm to lift the blade up out of the water. And then you can see he's right back instantly into the position that he was in, in his basic stance, right? Even here, he's in his basic stance position. Ankle flexion, knees slightly bent, hips pretty much level with his heels, lower body, lower legs and upper body close to the same angle, right? He's already kind of in an unstable position leaning forward from his feet. And all he's got to do is put the paddle out in front of him again and he's ready for the next stroke. So I'll just actually back up a, a whole frame here. So you can see, here he is finishing his stroke, hips coming under his body, blade popping out of the water, he's in his stance. And you can see all he's got to do is reach and rotate to the catch and he's ready for the next stroke. This is it, you know, is this perfect? You know, there's some things he still needs to work on, um, but, they're small, like we're talking small refinements to his technique right now. He's doing a really good job. And why is it important that he uses legs as much as he's using, uses hips as much as he's doing um, in terms of getting a workout? Like it's, it, it clearly is if he's gonna race because using big force producing muscles is gonna, is gonna generate more power against the water he has in his blade and that's gonna generate faster board speed. But for somebody who's just interested in getting a workout, well, again, contrast this to the people that you see in commercials who just stand up straight in their boards um, and just use their arms. Like, look at the degree to which he's using his legs and the muscles and the, the you know muscles crossing his hips. And he's not just using you know his legs, but all of the hip flexor muscles and all of his core muscles, in addition to the muscles in his upper body that are you being used as connectors. Like he's using a lot of muscle mass and that's gonna create a very big demand for oxygen, which is gonna place a big demand on the oxygen delivery system, which is your cardiovascular system, right? And, and what Victoria was talking about, about you know getting your heart rate elevated to be in a particular training zone or to be working at a level of perceived exertion. So it's much easier to get to that training zone if you're using big muscles in this kind of fashion. Um, and then the other thing is, too, that you can't um, expect to train and tone and strengthen muscles that you're not using. So if he weren't using his legs to this degree or the muscles crossing his hips to this degree or the muscles in his core to this degree, um, or even if he didn't have this much water held on his blade, 
he wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be able to use his upper body muscles. To, they wouldn't be required to work as hard because there would be less water loaded on his blade. So, you know, the degree to which he's doing all these things really enhance not just his ability to work in the desired training zones, but it really allows him to train these muscles or in a way that he wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And you, I think you can agree, like when you see how much his legs are working here, like if he's doing this repetitively for 45 minutes of an aerobic workout, you can see like, that's like doing a whole bunch of partial squats. That's like doing partial squats for 45 minutes. So think about how amazing that is as a workout vehicle, okay? So he's doing a really great job here with his technique. And this is a very good exemplar of the type of technique that, that um, is effective, um, it's efficient, um, it's gonna allow for somebody to be a decent racer if they're willing to do the fitness training to support high level racing. Um, but it's also a great example of the technique that's gonna allow anyone to go out and get a really good workout. Okay, so um, um, let me stop the video now and I'm gonna go over to the other room again and I'm gonna grab my paddle and I'm gonna talk to you about um, land drills, okay? And um, how you can get, well, let me just, before I do that, let me just say that there's one other thing. Remember at the, at the very top, I said that um, um, and we're all different and we're all gonna look different when we paddle. So each and every one of you, after me telling you that this is a really good technique, each and every one of you could be doing the same things as this guy is here, but look a little bit differently doing them. And that's to be expected because you're different. We're different shapes and sizes. Some people have more of their length in their upper body, some more in their lower body. Um, the length of our long bones, you know, like our upper arm, our lower arm, our femur, our lower leg, they're different in all of us. Uh, uh, points of origin and attachment uh, of muscles are different in all of us. Some people have more fast twitch muscle fibers, some pe people more slow twitch muscle fibers. Some people more developed aerobic systems, some people are stronger. Like we all have different physical toolkits and it's gonna result in us all looking a little bit different, even though we're trying to do the same things when we're paddling. But the one thing I will say is that I've looked at a lot of video of all the top pros. And if I take the video and I freeze it, at certain points in the stroke, the remarkable thing is that they look really similar. And one of the places where people look similar is here, where you see this lightning bolt, you see ankle flexion, you see knees bent, you see hips forward, you see this kind of rotation, and you get the impression that their center mass is in front of their body, okay? That's a pretty common position. Um, another really common position is here for most athletes, most pros, is where they finished loading, their hips are behind them now because they drove with their hips during the pull, their legs are more bent because they used their legs, bending their legs, they get the blade deeper into the water, and they've, they're bent over because they've got their upper body weight onto the paddle, the paddle is just, just turned through vertical, so it's slightly negative, and their top hands in front of their face. And again, this is a really common position that you see amongst all the pros. And then the good pros who unload immediately and don't get stuck down there, they tend to look, they tend to find this position where the blade doesn't drag way, way behind them. And it gets out fairly early and it gets out as a result of them straightening their legs and bringing their hips forward under their body and they get right back into their basic stance from which they then just have to go forward with their hands to get back to their next catch or the next setup, okay? And it's remarkable how people hit these three positions, even though when, they, when you run the video and they start to connect the dots between these positions, they'll look pretty differently to the naked eye. So, um, Getting to land drills, when I was a kid uh, learning to paddle my, uh, my sprint racing canoe, um, I'm pretty old, so it was 1976, and the Olympics were in Montreal. 
And there was a guy from um, our local club who was racing the C1 500 meter event um, there. And uh, he was uh, currently going in the Olympics, was ranked fifth in the world. And he was touted as a chance at a medal. And so he got a lot of coverage in the local newspapers and magazines and things like that. And then also there was a lot of pictures of the, the top guys in the world. Um, you know, some of the, the European guys, the Hungarians, the, the Russians, the, the, the Czechs, the Poles, the whatever. And, um, and so there's lots of pictures in newspapers and magazines of all the top athletes in the world. And I cut every picture out of the magazine and the newspaper. Um, it wasn't a YouTube world. It wasn't a, a video world. There were no videos, but there was lots of still photos. <clears throat> and what I did is I cut them all out and I would uh, arrange them uh, by phase of the stroke around me. And I would sit and I would get in front of a full length mirror at my parents' house with a broom. And the broom handle was about the same length as my paddle shaft. And the broom, the bristles on the broom were like the paddle blade. And when I leaned on them, they would flex a little bit. So I could kind of practice like leaning on the paddle, like the paddle would be going in the water. And I would get into the paddling position in front of the full length mirror at my parents' house. And I would look at the pictures that I had arrayed around me. And I would mimic the positions that I saw these athletes in. And I would like be really meticulous about how I was mimicking them. I would like try to be in exactly the same position. I'd look at the picture, I'd look at the mirror, I'd look at the picture, I'd look at the mirror until I got it right. And no one told me to do this. I just did it because I was a kid and I couldn't stop thinking about paddling. I was really, it really captured my imagination. But what I found was that by getting into these positions on land, it made it way easier to find them on the water. And in fact, I was able to paddle with really decent technique that looked like, like a, a top level athlete at the end of that summer. And most of my peers were you know, not able to paddle well at all because they didn't really give it any thought. And so you know, that really helped me fast track my development. And by the age of 17, um, I was racing in Europe against senior age paddlers. And I came fifth in a big world cup against the guys who were going to race at the Olympics that summer um, as, a 50, as a 17 year old. Um, uh, and so um, it made a huge difference to my development. And I've since realized through working with guys like the guy in the picture in the video here, that um, getting people into the right positions on land really fast tracks them being able to find those positions in the water. Like if you can find them on land, you'll find them more easily on the water. And once you've found, you know, two or three positions on the water, your body's intelligent enough to connect the dots between them. And the next thing you know, you're paddling with really good technique. And so for a relatively small investment time of doing, you know, 10 minutes worth of land drills, you know, um, three, four, five times a week, you can really fast track your ability to paddle with good technique on the water. It's amazing what a difference it makes. Okay. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you now that we've seen the video and we have a good mental image of what it looks like, you know, on when somebody's actually paddling. I'm going to show you um, some land drills um, that will help you, I think, um, if you do them and do them in front of a full length mirror so you know you're doing them properly. Um, it'll really help you uh, more quickly learn good technique in the water. And I'll also tell you that, that, you know, this video is going to be recorded so you'll be able to watch me demonstrate the land drills again and again. But there are these videos on our website where I go into each drill in detail, and they're also on our YouTube channel. So um, there's lots of places where you can find me demonstrating these land drills. And please, you know, I invite you to try them. I know it sounds silly that doing something on land could actually make you do it better on the water, but trust me, it makes a huge difference, okay? So let me go to the other room, and I'll show you the, the drills that I'm talking about. I'm just gonna, Stop the share in the video so the picture of me uh, is going to be bigger. Okay, 
So the first drill I want to show you is for the stance. Can you guys see me all right? Just give me a yes. Yeah, all good? Yes, Larry. Yes. Yeah. All good. Okay, so the first video is for the stance. And, and the stance is really important, right? Uh, I mentioned earlier that you could be, you could be, um, you can bend your knees. And there's two different ways to bend your knees. One is by sticking your butt out behind you. That's the stance you don't want. Notice that my weight is nice and balanced over my feet right now, right? My upper body's leaning forward. My bum's up behind me. They're counterbalancing each other. Where is my weight going to be when I stick my paddle in the water? It's not going to be on my paddle. It would be on my feet. The other way to bend your knees is by bending your ankles. And I bent my knees, okay? All of a sudden now, my hips didn't roll behind me. They're forward. And really all I have to do from here is just, just lean forward a little bit and I'm in the right stance. There is my basic lightning bolt position, right? That looks just like the video, only I'm in my living room view, okay? So again, it's like ankle flexion, knees over your toes, just like you're wearing ski boots. Squeeze your glutes a little bit if you have to, to make sure you keep your hips forward. And then just think about bottom hand, reaching forward, bottom hand reaches forward, it pulls your shoulder with it, and that pulls your piling side hip with it a bit, that helps keep your hips forward. And then you just, as you start to lose your balance forward, you lose it on your paddle, okay? And that gives you the idea too of having a little bit of that forward instability that's going to allow you to get the, encourage you to get the blade buried more quickly and allow you to get weight on your blade instantly at the catch, okay? So again, ankle flexion, knees over your toes, hips forward, keep your hips forward, reach to catch with your bottom hand, and there you go, okay? From in front, just so that we remember our steering drill and paddling close to the rail, it kind of looks like this, okay? Ankle flexion, hips forward, reach to catch, and there you can see my blade squared up, it's vertical from your perspective. It's not like this, right? I'm out over the water, okay? So you can practice that with the mirror at the side so you can see what you look like from the side and you can practice it looking into the mirror as well to make sure that your, your blade is vertical, okay? So that's the first drill and it's just gonna help you with the front part of the stroke. It's gonna make sure that your blade um, doesn't that you don't lose a lot of blade angle if your blade doesn't travel a great distance getting buried and it's going to ensure that you get body weight on the blade right away at the front of the stroke the second drill i wanted to show you is what happens after the blade is in the water and how you start your pull so you're going to be in that position with your hips forward and the starting the pull is going to come from here it's just going to come from your hips starting to go back, okay? Just your hips starting to go back. And your hips can go back rotationally like that, or they can go back as one kind of thrust where both sides of your hips go back together like that. Most people kind of do a bit of both, okay? Like pure rotation is one extreme and just thrusting back with your hips is the other extreme. Most people feel most comfortable somewhere in the middle. I'm definitely somewhere in the middle, okay? But you just want to stay in that position and you want to get used to just, just creating some flex in your paddle shop. Remember the flex that was in his paddle shop in the video? So you're just going to just create some flex in your shop and make sure that it's not coming from your lats or your arms, but it's actually coming from your hips. It's just being transmitted through your lats and your arms to the paddle, okay? Um, and then the next drill, we can put our paddle down and it's to help you think about how to do that pull where you saw him thrust his hips back and bend his legs and get into this position by the end of it, right? So we really use his hips and his legs and he kind of bent over and crunched his body onto the paddle as he was pulling. And so for this drill, 
When I'm doing clinics, I get people to partner up and I get them to stand opposite each other. And so they'll stand opposite each other. They'll reach out with their, say their right hand. So I'll reach out. My partner will be facing me. He'll we'll grab our right hands. One person is just dead weight and the other person is pulling. And I'll ask the person who's pulling to try to pull the person, the other person towards them like they were pulling their paddle with their paddling side hand, okay? And most people will go like this. They'll kind of go, they'll pull and they'll bend their legs a little bit and they'll drive their hips back. And the guy will, who's the dead weight, will, will come forward. They'll pull him forward. And then I ask them to really think about not just pulling back, but actually pulling down and back and finishing with their hand kind of level or just on a slightly lower than their knee. And I'll ask them to do that really forcefully. And the guy that there who's the dead weight will go flying. Okay, so it's much more powerful if you kind of use your legs and 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 get a little and when you get lower like that, it causes you to crunch a bit more with your upper body. That's much more powerful. The other thing that it does is it allows you to get the blade to go deeper into the water as you're pulling. And when it goes deeper into the water, it actually, um, this is a long discussion, so I'll, I'll abbreviate it. There's lots of information about this um, on the website. Um, but it basically, the blade, if it goes deeper into water, it keeps finding layers of water molecules that haven't been disturbed yet. And that it can reach in and, and the tip of the paddle can interact with them and really grab against them. Rather than if you pull a really shallow stroke, a lot of the water that you start to work against will move from the face of your blade to the back of your blade, okay? And so you lose a little bit of the connection that you could otherwise have. Kind of like if your foot slipped in the sand when you were pushing off. But if you, if you probe a little bit deeper with your paddle and use the water column, um, it, it helps enhance connection. So, so here's what that drill looks like again from the side. You would be, you can use your paddle to help you get into the right position. Just kind of lean on it like this, okay? So your, your hips are still forward, you're like this. You've got the blade buried now. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna go like that. You're just gonna squat back and try to pull until you would, you know, your paddle would be in that position. Top hand in front of your face, paddle closer to your feet, but not at your feet, right? So again, we're looking at the positions that you saw this guy in in the video, okay? But that's the one that really helps you do your pull, do your loading. Like, it's not enough to just get body weight on at the catch. Once you've got body weight on the paddle, go with it. Like, really keep loading weight on, onto the paddle and really, like, climb on top of it until you get to, get to that point where your top hand's in front of your face, your blade's gone through vertical, it's approaching your feet, but not quite there yet. And you can't really load in anymore, okay? And then for the last drill is gonna help you with the unload. So now you've got to this point here, your top hand's in front of your face and I'm holding my paddle down further now because I can't drive it into the floor like I could drive it into the water, right? So my top hand's in front of my face, my bottom hand is, is there. Okay, my paddle is slightly negative, right? It's still in front of my feet. But what I want to try to do now is I want to try to push on my paddle. I push down with my top hand to keep my paddle stuck into the floor. And I want to try to kind of lever my way past the paddle. But what I found, I used to have people try to do that, and I found it's really hard for them. So what I've been doing more recently is I've been asking people to get into this position right? And then I want them to take their hand off the paddle, put it on their butt, and push their butt forward. And see what happens when I push my butt forward, right? I'm bringing my hand, my hips to where my hand would be. I'm bringing my hips to my paddle. I'm straightening my legs, and I'm stand, I look like I'm standing up because my hips are coming under my body. Now, I'm Actually, you can see I'm actually pushing myself when I bring my hips forward past my paddle, right? So 
the way I've been doing it is I put the paddle out there. And I put my hand where it would be if it was on the paddle. Top hands in front of my face still. And I go like this. I'll just push myself forward back into that position that I wanted to be at at the catch. And you should be, a good technique has you exiting the water and right into position for the next catch. Remember, we talked about direct movement. So if you can be exit the water and be right into the position for the next catch, it's something you just kind of have to rotate forward with your upper body. That's perfect. Okay, but this using your hips and your legs coming under your body is really going to help you, like I showed here, is really going to help you push yourself past the paddle. And that results in a big burst of acceleration off the back of your stroke. And <clears throat> what that does is it helps you obviously carry more speed between strokes and makes the next catch easier. Okay, so that's really important. And once you get good at doing it with your hand on your hips, the hand on your butt, you don't have to put your hand on your butt anymore. You can actually just kind of leave it. You can just leave it down here and pretend that you're pulling the paddle and you can just do that motion there. And as your hips come underneath your body, that's kind of the cue to start to lift your paddle out of the water. Okay, but those land drills, if you do them and do them diligently, you know, for like 10 minutes a day, you know, four days a week, three days a week, four days a week, five days a week, whatever, like, you know, we can all find probably 10 minutes um, in front of the mirror. They'll make a huge difference. And um, um, like, like, a, like a huge difference in terms of um, how quickly you're able to learn good technique on the water. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I don't want to talk uh, at length anymore. Like you've been with us for two, almost two and a half hours, which is, you guys are fantastic. And uh, we talked a lot, but, um, you know, hopefully if you, I know a lot of people bailed out because there's only 19 of us now. Um, there was 40 something before, but I'm sure they'll come back and, you know, watch it on the replay. But I just want to, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, I want to um, let you know that if you have any questions, like, let's not bother with Q and A's tonight because um, we've already been going for a long time. Uh, but if you have any questions, just log on to our Facebook page and um, and ask your question, and uh, we'll make sure that we visit it and and answer your questions um, in the best detail we possibly can. Um, we're going to do more of these uh, Zoom seminars over the next several weeks into the summer. Um, so please join us for more. We're going to try to have topics that we think will be interesting for everybody. And I would also like to say if there's a topic that you would like to know more about, um, then again, log on to the Facebook page and, uh, and ask us, you know, hey, what about a, uh, what about a, a Zoom on, on this or what about a Zoom on that? And um, we'll certainly um, consider um, I'm doing that for you. So um, uh, I know that um, I enjoy doing these. And um, if anything that we've done tonight helps you have uh, a better experience on the water, then, uh, then that will be fantastic because that's why we're doing it. Um, and I'll just also say that, um, you know, I, felt, I kind of felt like I was rushing through some of the stuff uh, just there with the drills. Um, there's a ton of information uh, on our YouTube channel and more even more so on our website. And a lot of it is free. Some of it is um, premium content um, and that's only $10 a month. Um, so like it's a couple of Starbucks lattes, um, but a lot of it is free. And um, so please, you know, log on, see what we have, see if, uh, what you think, if it's going to be again, helpful for your paddling this summer, then um, you know, that, is going to make us really happy because that's why we're doing it. So, um, yeah, thanks again. And I don't know, Victoria, you still there? You want to add anything? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Um, no, I just want to say thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope that you guys learned something. Um, I know that I'm in Florida, so we're not thawing out. We're actually heating up, but I know everybody's thawing out in the rest of the parts of the world and um, getting on the water and stoked to be back on the water. So I hope that you're able to start your season solidly with this information. And yeah, we're here if you need us.
Awesome. Okay. And Lisa, thank you. Lisa, you got any to add? No, nope, just don't be afraid to fall. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks so much. And again, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Okay. Like, uh, honestly, um, that's what my, that's what my whole job is. Like people ask questions, I answer them. So uh, um, I'm happy to, to answer them to the best of my ability. So thank you for joining us. And um, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to seeing people that are my part of the world in the water. And uh, the rest of you, um, I'll look forward to seeing you post, you know, on, the, on social media about your paddling experiences this summer and try to follow you. All right. Thanks again.